And now I pass the word to the organizers. So I guess that means uh, me. Uh, so good morning, everybody, and welcome to the third day and the mini colloquium. And um, let's just jump into it right away. So it's a pleasure to welcome Peter Bergel from the Technical University of Denmark. And Peter is going to tell us about lithographic nanoporous graphene and band gap engineering. So please, Peter. Uh, all right. Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay. And I'll start my timer. I will just see if I can keep the time this time. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be, I'm not really sure where, um, <laughs> with you, uh, wherever in cyberspace that is. And it's my, um, I'm looking forward to uh, tell you about some of the research we have done, uh, some of which have started uh, a decade ago, uh, but uh, has accelerated a bit the past few years. Uh, so uh, I am from Denmark. I'm in Denmark right now. It's very weird to be in a conference and not be at it uh, or whatever, but uh, this is uh, actually our old building. So we have moved now. All our offices and labs are now in a single floor. But these guys from our center of excellence uh, are the ones that perhaps have contributed the most to what I will present in the next half hour. Yeah, in particular, uh, Lene Gammelgaard and uh, Bjarke Jensen, Jose Haldad, uh, Gaetano Mess, actually many of them <laughs> in Tim Booth. Okay, so let me just move on. Um, so I will talk, uh, try to motivate why we are interested in patterning graphene. Uh, we are, I will talk about some of the issues we have been fighting for a long, long time. Edge roughness, when we pattern graphene, we have edge roughness. And also, uh, we discovered that uh, the chemistry or the, uh, the, what you could call the molecular uh, activity near the edges is also very important to control. And in the end, I will um, tell you about something we did uh, recently, where we finally managed to punch holes in graphene without ruining it. Ruining it. So let me start by um, just, uh, as you've seen a number of times, uh, we are concentrated on what goes on here at the K point of the, the graphene vein structure. And what uh, motivated a uh, long time ago, uh, the leader of our center and uh, Antti Pereyaho and colleagues to uh, about this material is why maybe we can open a band gap. So this is a very early work from 2008, actually uh, you know, started more or less, I think right after the graphene was uh, announced in 2004. And one of the things they've noted is that when you punch holes in graphene, you can open a band gap. And that was immediately interesting. And the theorist in this center we got soon after has are way ahead of us. They have predicted so many cool things and we just took very long time to uh, somehow manage to do any of that. So we, I, I was an expert in e-beam lithography and said, sure, I can, you know, um, I can, I, can, uh, I can punch holes in graphene, that's very easy for me. Um, but uh, as it turned out, this has taken nearly 10, 10 years to learn to do right. So um, why do we bother? Because now uh, in, in the, over the uh, past few years, we've had these fantastic structures that are way better than anything you can ever hope to do with lithography, except maybe if you have an STM tip and remove atoms one by one. So the thing is that while these structures are are superior in what we are doing in almost any way. There's a single thing that we as engineer cannot really do well with this kinds of structures yet. And that's um, uh, making arbitrary structures. So we are interested in deciding where there are holes and where there are not holes, making different size holes and have this complete freedom as we're used to from lithography. So in that sense, we are going to back down onto the stone age where we literally have to pattern these 2D materials ourselves and somehow make it work. So uh, yeah, I mean, to us, arbitrary nanopores means new components and periodic nanopores means new materials. So we're interested in both of this. So if you look at graphene and you remove the bulk, you have this, uh, this wonderful system that is uh, where we can do patterns here. That was uh, the theorist. Uh, uh, they they got, went into our experimental restaurant and ordered, can we please have some holes? 
and we said sure uh, we can do all that but it is as it turns out the disorder which was a much more serious problem than we anticipated back then uh, so uh, this is particularly serious for graphene and we'll try to explain a bit about that but it has to do with the fact that graphene is a crystal that is entirely consisting of surfaces and surfaces are just horrible so uh, it's interesting but it's also uh, something as an engineering point of view is, is, is messy. But graphene is a 2D surface with its own 1D surface. So we are kind of asking for trouble trying to engineer this. Coming from 3.5 materials like gallium arsenide, once you're when you're making a nanoconstriction, it's like trying to make a, a, a conducting nanostructure, you are forcing electrons through a soft electrostatic potential and easily easily get this sort of wonderful uh, conductance quantization and there's a good agreement with the theory and the experiments most of the time. In graphene, it's a different story. Now we are truncating the crystal. We're creating dangling bonds. We have a hard potential uh, instead of this nice soft electrostatic potential. And now, even if we can make the structures uh, looking perfect in a microscope, we still end up with something that has, is nothing like the wonderful curves that we were used to in the 90s. So the problem is that uh, graphene is very susceptible to disorder. And that means that the electron current that flows through a graphene nanoconstriction is very responsive to disorder. And I'll try to show you how, just how much that can be. So this is something that is known a long time ago, um, uh, that you get this sort of dis, uh, disorder potential where the electrons have to jump from island to island, like jump from quantum dot to quantum dot, uh, uh, even, with, uh, not, even with a quite small edge disorder. And I'll show you just, you know, uh, so, so how that is. So this is a 100 nanometer nanoconstriction. It's not that narrow. And we uh, fabricated these and noted that we couldn't make conductance quantization in these. The thing is that uh, you have to go to something like, you have to kind of fine tune your patterning onto the nanometer scale until they start to behave like they should. So although it's 100 nanometer wide, just one nanometer of this order. So this is the normal, normal patterning is around three to five nanometer roughness is typically what you get with standard e-beam lithography. And we thought this is a very wide channel, so, so what's the problem? But the thing is that, that the, the transmission through this channel sits at around 30% of the maximum theoretical transmission. But if we are optimizing the edge, so the nanometer, uh, so the roughness is just one nanometer, uh, then we uh, sit at 70 to 80%. So that's a bit counterintuitive that a little bit of disorder can have such a big impact on how the current flows through a narrow structure even when it's not that narrow. So uh, we found that uh, it has to do with charge accumulation near the edges. That means that um, due to the electrostatics of the system, so this is a, this is a ribbon seen from the front and this is the back gate, there, uh, there's a tendency of the current or the, the charge to accumulate, accumulate at the edges. And we believe that's the major reason why things go wrong when the edges are disordered. So it also particularly serious for the quantum Hall effect where you have edge currents tra uh, going along the edges. But, uh, but what you can see here is, uh, is the theoretical calculations where it's showing that the edge accumulation is depending strongly on whether the edges are rough or not. So you have a much more spiky uh, charge accumulation when the edges are, are smooth and when not. And that also means to changes in the local density, local density of states we were able to show that actually the quantum Hall effect is killed when you have smooth edges, which was again the opposite of what we thought. Just because we go from five nanometer roughness to one nanometer roughness, suddenly the conductance, uh, the quantum Hall effect sort of uh, uh, kind of stopped working, you could say, due to these sort of uh, bumps in the local density of states. So we uh, spent a lot of time on the past two, 10 years and trying all sorts of things. One of the cool things we did, which we are sort of taking up again, is anisotropic etching. So this is a transmission electron microscope. It's just one of many examples I have on how we try to combat this fundamental problem. We try to say, maybe we can make the crystal um, etch itself so that we don't have to do it. And maybe we can do it so that it, it adheres to the lattice um, orientations. So these are two holes that are etched in a suspended piece of graphene filmed in a transmission electron microscope. And as you can see, it's not perfect, but the smoothness is quite low. And when you zoom in in a still image, you can see it's a kind of like one nanometer. So it's not 
that much better than uh, than with lithography, the one that we I showed you before. But the interesting here is that it sort of follows the crystal directions. And this is something we have also did in a different way, uh, which we call the Pac-Man method, where we, instead of just having uh, oxygen etching the graphene, we use silver particles that uh, catalyze uh, carbon atom removal at high temperatures inside a TM. So when you do that, you put silver, use silver particles, they act as small garbage collectors and, um, and go along the crystal directions, cutting out. Uh, so this is, uh, ah, yeah, there's no scale bar here, but it's, um, this is about 10 nanometer or so. So the kind of patterns that you can etch out are extremely sharp. This method is really, really interesting for us, except for one thing, we could not, we could not control these silver particles. We tried with magnetic particles and controlling magnetic fields, but we can't really order. We can make non-trivial structures, but we cannot really design them in the same way as with chopped-down lithography. So, uh, so this is uh, some of the methods we tried over the years, nanoparticle etching, nanosphere lithography, directed self-assembly with uh, block copolymers, in-plane heterostructure growth, really interesting work, growing graphene, um, uh, alloys on uh, iridium, so we could get eight nanometer period and two nanometer graphene quantum dots, uh, nanoprint lithography, and then this anisotropic etching. These are some of the things we tried <laughs> over the years. And none of them give us really the full freedom to design that we have with elect electron beam lithography. So that, and that turns out to be a deal breaker for us because some of the structures that are most interesting that the theorists are presenting to us, and please make these because you can do a valley filter, you can do some really cool spintronics. They rely on us to be able to draw any shape we want so we can make exactly the pattern that the theorists have asked us to do. So wherefore we kind of go a little bit back and try to say, okay, we simply have to make electric beam lithography work better. And then not other problems, uh, problems are good for physicists because they are exciting, but it uh, can also be just problems. But one of the very cool problems we had was that, uh, that of hysteresis. So we thought we could solve it, like the fact that you water molecules or other things land on the basal plane, and maybe there's electrical field and they flip orientation and due to the dipole moment and their charge, they change the uh, charge distribution in the graphene, either by doping or some other way, scattering. So we want to eliminate that and encapsulate the graphene in uh, single crystals of hexagonal boron nitride as illustrated here. Um, and then uh, we still had hysteresis and we couldn't understand it. Uh, was it the water that was trapped or whatever? And then we found out, no, it has to be the edge that is accessed by these molecules. And um, then we started to look closer into it. Well, it was actually Jose Raridat who did this fantastic work with Mes Panpu and I was uh, also helping, <laughs> but uh, this is really Jose's work. In dry air, there's no hysteresis. When you let in a bit of water, you have a symmetric hysteresis. And if you've tried to measure on graphene, you know that it rarely is symmetric, not in this way. So already there, it's a bit strange. So we can switch it on and off just by removing or adding water. And because with this is airtight and watertight, we already think now it's probably not water diffusing in and out because we know that this kind of packaging is watertight. So it's somehow we already thought it has, it has to be the edges. Then <clears throat> another interesting thing was that it process, this is the reason it's scaled with the dipole moment of the molecule. If we have water, which has a, the, a, the largest uh, uh, dipole moment of 1.85 dBi, uh, the hysteresis, that's a black curve, is big, and then it scales as we go to NO2, which has a small dipole moment. The, the hysteresis is still there, but much weaker. That's also another thing uh, coming in, which is how well does this molecule bind to these edges? Uh, well, that is something also uh, Mess and uh, Mess, our, our dear chairman, and also Jose looked a lot into. And um, actually, when you are changing the edge termination, which we're able to controllably do in our clean room processes. We can replace the oxygen with fluorine on the same structure. We see that with oxygen, we, has, we have this hysteretic uh, shift and with fluorine, it's nearly gone. And uh, then uh, uh, when you uh, kind of calculate the binding energies of these molecules, you also see that the binding energy of water to fluorine is much smaller than it is to, uh, to oxygen. So depending on the edge chemistry, you may or may not have molecules speaking 
to your uh, to your 2D system. This thing should happen for any kind of nanoporous graphene that has edges and where the pores are large enough to fit in one of these extremely small polar molecules. So that means that whatever you try to do, we can be sure that the system is interacting strongly with the surroundings and particularly the edges seems to be a, a way to access the electron systems in a, in a much more profound way than we imagined. So uh, what was also interesting about this a thing that separates it from the usual kind of hysteresis effect you experience in the presence of water was it is that it's persistent. That means that once you have uh, kind of reached one of these, uh, these states, either the, um, uh, the uh, so, uh, maybe, uh, so yeah, I make, wait, I made to make, I forgot to make a pretty important point here. So yeah, that is that the origin of the, hysteresis effect uh, is in agreement with a picture where the dipole moment of the water aligns with the electrical field, which means that once the curve is on the right side, all the dipole moments align upwards. And when they're on the left side, all the dipole moments al uh, uh, align downwards. We saw by uh, theoretical calculations that there actually was two stable sites for the water molecules. The water molecule when it's oxygen terminated, can find one of either two stable sites, either up or down. So it really is like a flip switch where the uh, collective dipole moments of the, all these edge attached molecules speak to the graphene system and change the, ch the charge distribution, kind of in the same way when we have roughness, that there is a strong effect on the graphene system because it happens at the edge where the graphene is most sensitive. And this uh, manifests itself in kind of a memory effect that once we flip the water molecules to one side using the electrostatic field, then um, it stays like that and we can, uh, we can read the, uh, the, uh, this kind of uh, this uh, resistance bump, which is indicative of the charge neutrality point being offset. And we can sweep, flip it to the other side and do the same thing there. So we are considering where well, maybe this is also a measurement that shows like a textbook example of a MEMP capacitor. So the uh, either MEMP capacitor or MEMP resistor uh, kind of uh, device is, act is, is absolutely possible to create this way. We still don't know the dynamics. We don't know how fast these water molecules they flip, but we are pretty sure that this picture is at least partially correct. That uh, here is the boron nitride. You see the graphene in below here. And at the edge, we can orchestrate that the water molecules, they align in the same direction and stay like that for a while and flip them to the other side at will. This only happens when we have oxygen at the edges and it only happens when we have a sufficiently large dipole moment of the molecule in. in. But there are actually many molecules also in, in biotechnology that have a strong dipole moment. And also this ferroelectric ordering is seen in amino acids and all the kinds of uh, very interesting molecules. So we think this is an extremely attractive way to create a molecular electronic system in a, 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 where you, you, know, you don't have to do like thography to make the confinement because it's the 1D edge of the graphene that ensures the confinement. It's a different way to think about trap, trapping. Just like an, an, an atom is really not a box, it's an attractive potential where the electrons can't escape. You can also create a nanosurface that in, in, to all practical purposes, confines a very small number of atoms or molecules in a space where you can manipulate these. So this is to, to me a, a complete accident that resulted in a very nice molecular electronics um, device uh, after spending many years trying to make, uh, make it in a normal way with two electrodes close to each other, which is much, much harder. So the picture we have is the following, that you have this back gate and, uh, and the molecule sitting at the edge, and then we use the polarity of the back gate to flip it up and down to flip this red curve here, either to the right or to the left. So, um, so that's a, but so while it's interesting and so on, it also means that we really need to control the chemistry at the edges if we wanna make electronic devices that behave um, a, not as a sensor, not as a membrister, but as a stable device that where you do not have this huge, huge hysteresis. And I think that anybody who's doing electrical measurements on nanoporous uh, or some similar, like, similar kind of nano architectures will encounter this sort of issues at some point. So edges are highly sensitive to edge chemistry and the environment. And that means that, yeah, we have to protect the graphene. So 
Back to the uh, Van der Waals hatred structure. So now we made a classical hall bar where you pass in the current in one end and pull it out in the other end and you have some voltage electrodes along the, the side. The thing we did differently here uh, was to pattern half of the hall bar. And patterning graphene is something we've been trying to do for 10 years. So we kind of um, got to a point where we think we have reached the limit of what is possible to do with electron beam lithography. And I'll show you where I think that limit is. So here you have the graphene in HBN with a side contact. Here we are creating holes of order 20 nanometer, but where the, 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 the difficult parameter is to the pitch of around 35 nanometer. So the neck width is around 10 to 15 nanometer. And that's just not that easy to do. It took, took uh, two very talented PhDs that say, later became postdocs a number of years to get this right. But at the end of the day, we uh, create, can create uh, holes in, in, uh, in the graphene through the boron nitride. And this patterning through the boron nitride is really the key. It's not, uh, we thought about it, uh, but already when we were still thinking about it, two very nice papers came out from uh, Christoph Stampfer um, uh, and uh, Jonathan Eoms that showed that this is really the way to go. So if you want to pattern anything uh, without destroying it, it's good to pack it, to encapsulate it first. We did something else. So we experimenting, again, we experimenting with edges. It's kind of boring engineering work, but it pays off. Because the usual thing, way we do it is to have a quick edge that, that is used in literature. You burn down through the boron nitride and the graphene, and you do the whole thing in one go by mixing in a fluorine-based edge with oxygen. So that's just, boop. So you get this nice, uh, edge is a different story of why you get these uh, sloped edges, which we're looking into now. But let me just tell you that we always get these sloped edges. And here, the, the thing is that the back sputtering from the silicon dioxide, this is what we believe is happening, is a kind of etching the sidewall of these, uh, the stack and create roughness. So whenever we try to do it this way, we ended up with patterns that it's okay, but you know, it's not good enough. And it's uh, not something that is even approaching what theorists asked us to do. So uh, oxygen containing edge is too uh, brutal and it, it ends up with rough edges. So if you just remove the oxygen and just have the uh, SF6 is our favorite uh, edge for this kind of work, we slowly and controllably etch down through the boron nitride and the SF6 does not remove the carbon atoms, it fluorinates it. So it doesn't mean that it doesn't attack it. It's just that the fact that it can bind fluorine uh, to the carbon atoms uh, and create this sort of half, um, uh, this sort of half uh, uh, functionalized side also means that the edge stops there. And when we then switch to an oxygen uh, edge, we can just controllably remove the graphene layer and, you do, and, and that means that the graphene etching is the last thing that happens. So there's no over etching and we don't have this back sputtering of, of silicon dioxide uh, stuff. So at least that's what we, is what we think is happening, that we get far more smooth edges and results like these. So and this is uh, just uh, giving this kind of a, so this is a, a plot, let me explain. This is the estimated carrier mobility. It's not so trivial for small structures. And these are different attempts of making uh, nanostructures by us and other people in literature by nano imprint or nanosphere lithography, even lithography. And what you see is when the feature size is one micron, you're kind of on, on track on, on the ballistic limit. You can, make, you can make it so that the graphing in between the holes is still in order. It's okay, it's, it's, it's ballistic. But as you go below 100 nanometer, 10 to the second nanometer, you start to see a drastic decrease of the mobility. It's like when you go below 100 nanometer, the edge disorder really starts to snap off the channel and, and make it effectively much more narrow. So what we achieve by patterning through the boron nitride and playing for a long time with the etching was to get from this point where we usually are, uh, this is block of polymer lithography, very nice looking patterns, but essentially worthless to a three orders of magnitude increase of the carrier mobility. So it really does make a difference. And then we try, try to look at the, finally, we could start to look at these the band gap opening and the magnetotransport, things like that, that the theorists have asked us to do 10 years ago. And um, 
in the clean region, we have this Landau fan. So this is the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, energy levels that you increase the magnetic field. The spacing between the, the degenerate the Landau levels increases and you get this characteristic fan. It's all over literature. And you also see this sort of clone and actually there's something going here on as well. If I have time, I will just say a bit about that because that's really interesting. But for now, we just said, okay, this is an indication that the sample is not too bad. Uh, it's, an, it's not perfect, but it's also made with very thin boron nitride. So we did some things that makes it a bit harder to get high mobility, but it kind of looks good. Then what about this region? And over here in the patent region, we have something that looks entirely different. Now the Landau levels are curved and we have something that looks like a like the blue region means low conductivity. So it looks like we actually have a gap of around 160 MeV perfectly in agreement with theoretical predictions that close off instead of opens on the left side. You see here the gap or the distance between your energy levels is increasing when you turn on the magnetic field on the left side, but on the right side, it's the opposite. So it's exactly as it should be. And, and when we ask the theorists, okay, can you just try to please uh, calculate you know, what, what it should look like for exactly this system. Uh, initially it looked like this, but then they added a little bit of edge disorder, which kind of blurs the picture a bit. So this is magnetic field and gate voltage, and it's a theoretical calculation with tight binding for our system. But when you add a little bit of, um, uh, and these are the experiments, so you see it's not a really a perfect fit, but when you add a bit of disorder to the edges, you see it kind of behaves it really clicks in and becomes a perfect match. So this is uh, really the first time we've seen anything that we've made that just bang on is exactly as predicted. And it's also very rare in literature because the moment you carve graphene out, you, it's very difficult to get, uh, to get the results to line up with theoretical predictions. But uh, so at least, uh, yeah, so just for, uh, to, to make another check, uh, the, our colleagues at Aalborg University, Thomas Garn Pedersen, uh, they uh, calculated and used another model where they uh, used a sort of skipping orbit. So you can imagine the electrons in the magnetic field that jump around the holes like this. And based on that, uh, they uh, solved the Dirac equation. Um, it's like, a, I won't go into detail, but the thing is that it's not an atomistic model, it's a continuous model where the holes are, are simulated by introducing a mass term. And that way uh, they got uh, uh, this result, which also kind of looks uh, rather a lot like our experiments. So we have two different ways of calculating, uh, calculating this and also the quantitatively, it, 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 we, with zero parameter fits, we could get a, a nearly perfect agreement. So I have three minutes left according to my watch. So if that's okay, I'd like to just point out one thing that is really making, giving me hope in terms of using uh, lithography for doing patterning on the nanoscale. So it has to do with uh, the Moiré effects. I'm sure you've heard a lot about that already. Uh, so this is boron the graphene and boron nitride together and rotate a little bit, you get the superstructure. So this is well known. Five, six years back, people started to look into this and noted that the uh, Landau vein could be cloned along the energy axis. I'll show you uh, kind of what I mean here. So this is the, our Landau vein here. And then you see a replica here. And this is actually also a replica of this structure here. So you see these kind of mini gaps. So you can imagine this is the energy axis. We're changing the Fermi energy on the X axis. And you get these sort of uh, mini versions of the, of the uh, linear dispersion uh, structures, uh, different places in the bank gap at different energies that comes from this superstructure that we introduce with a Moray effect. So if you look at these uh, exact angles that we have in our system, you see a Moray pattern, something like this. So we know the angles um, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from measurement. What we see here is uh, two different uh, possible superstructures that you can make. Um, and what we kind of think uh, when we calculate the period and compare with the shift in gate voltage, we can see that this short one, the, the small one must correspond to, to this one here at minus eight uh, volts of gate voltage, so this gate voltage here, and the big yellow one, more, uh, th this echo that comes here, corresponds to the large one, the large period of 17 nanometer. So um, when we pattern it, the cool thing is that, yeah, number two, this one is, is destroyed. So this is showing the, the, how big the holes are compared to this uh, lattice here. 
but the small period, although the graphene is heavily, heavily densely patterned, still you see, um, you see the signature here, it kind of survives the patterning, which means that some aspect of these moiretronics, really subtle uh, interlayer interactions that gives rise to changing in the band structure can survive this dense bombardment and removal of carbon atoms. So the boron nitride is far more effective in protecting the graphene that we even hoped for. You can even imagine things like superconducting bilayer uh, graphene that survives nanopatterning on the 10 nanometer scale so that some aspects of this superconducting uh, property still survives. So just to show you that, um, that I, uh, it's, it's true, so we examined, um, so this is a, a different way of plotting, um, this is resistivity, but this, are the, this is the main band gap opening structure and this is the echo. And now by uh, zooming in and changing the colors here, you, uh, you, you see they're actually identical. That means that the, the, the change in band structure we did at zero gate voltage is also cloned up here. So it really is the same uh, transformation that happens also uh, in the mini gap. So it, it, I don't think I'm out of time, but I can say that it lines up quantitatively really well uh, so that the change from the Landau fan, which is what you, um, uh, what you see. Uh, so, sorry, Peter, I, I think actually, according to my program, you have, uh, you have enough time. Okay, but I thought that was I was supposed to leave some time for for discussion. Yeah, well, maybe five minutes is okay. Okay, all right. Um, yeah. Okay. So, uh, so the the yeah. I think I will just yeah. So I think that my point that I want to make here is that uh, we can imagine. Tristronics and moiretronics, if you can allow me to call it something as, as like that, where we, despite repatterning it to the best of our ability, to the limit of what can be done by e-beam lithography, if we try to consider closely how to protect the edges against a chemical kind of arbitrary chemistry, but also to protect the edges to, from disorder, it is actually possible to pattern such structures. And what I think it also means is that if you're looking at the kinds of nanopore structures that are fabricated uh, by our Spanish colleagues, uh, uh, Aita and Cesar and Diego, I believe that such structures can also be patterned on a really small scale if we are careful to, to, to protect the structures before we start the patterning. So I think that's a, that's a kind of a revit, re vitalized hope for creating true quantum um, transport structures that are, are, can benefit from both the, the bottom-up uh, architectures that are uh, unparalleled in terms of atomic control, but also from the top-down fabrication, which are unparalleled in, in terms of design control or a kind of freedom to design whatever structure you like. So uh, yeah, uh, maybe uh, you can uh, think about the uh, nano squids with, uh, with bilayer graphene or something else. But graphene nanoelectronics on the 10 nanometer scale is possible. We don't know if we can, if the same thing works for any other material than graphene because we didn't try it yet, but it's at least not as impossible as we thought. And there's a real hope that we can utilize the 60 years of, uh, of uh, expertise built up in electron um, beam uh, in, in scanning electron microscopy and electron beam lithography, uh, and also utilize these on a nanoscale. So, uh, if you are interested in this work, you can read more about it in this paper here. And I can just say that this is one of the original pictures, not from this paper, but from the original paper from 2008, where N.T. Pekayahu and Thomas Peterson they announced the, uh, uh, that they want to work with the antidote lattices and started to knock on my door and say, Peter, you should make some holes in this new material graphene. Um, and right now where we're at is not quite there because we still have a, a almost a, something like a factor of a five to go. Uh, but we've gone so far that we can make structures in graphene that has characteristic dimensions of 10 to 15 nanometer that uh, show a very high agreement with theoretical predictions. So I think you should reconsider uh, giving up on e-beam lithography also for this sort of thing and just thinking, thinking about it as a practical problem 
on, on, uh, on how to do it just right so that you don't ruin the structures that you're interested in. And this work was uh, done by a lot of people and uh, most of them are here. Bjarke, Lena and Jose have uh, played a major role in the work. Uh, uh, so Bjarke is now at Columbia University working with Corey Dean. Uh, Joachim also did the anisotropic etching, he's at MIT now. Gaetano could be here, Gaetano? I can't, you can't answer, but I think he might be, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so so uh, Mes Panpu, our chairman, has also been uh, playing a big role in, 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 in figuring out uh, what is going on in these nanosystems. And this, I would say, maybe particularly for the dipole moment, the dipole uh, molecules flipping at the edge of graphene, it's really something we are still very um, excited about learning more about because I think we've just started to scratch the surface, uh, literally speaking, of the graphene in this, in this, excuse me for the pun, but I think that, that there's much more to do. So that is, I think, all I have to say and um, thank you for your attention. So thank you, Peter. Um, I've not seen any questions in the chat. Um, so if people have questions, maybe they can just uh, open their microphone or just write maybe in the chat that they have a question and then I can open the microphone. Isaac has a question now. He writes and also okay. Jennifer. Yeah, okay, so, so I, I, I go on. Uh, so uh, Peter, one, one question regarding the, um, the water sensitivity device that you built. Um, so, um, I guess that that was done in, in liquid, right? Or, or, or that was done in, in no, gas phase? It's done with a, a, a small amount of water humidity or humidity. All right. Yeah, it's gas because have, have you thought about actually, well, I, I, okay, may, maybe actually destroy <laughs> the, the device, but I mean, because that would be a pH detector, I think. Uh, like, you know, but of course, yeah. then maybe yeah. when, when you put the thing on, on water, it just, there is. I, I can say that, that uh, yesterday I, I submitted a proposal for, for doing that. So All right. to, to extend, okay. this, uh, extend okay. this as a measurement device for water channels. Okay, because I think that, uh, you know, that, that mechanism that, that you've got there should be highly dependent on pH. I hope so. I hope at least I hope the reviewers are convinced. And you know, I mean, normally I don't talk about uh, um, proposals that are just submitted, but I just wish we had some more competition or not. Comp I wouldn't call it competition, but more people who are going in this direction because I think it's as a there's a it's it's um, there are so many mysteries, and and I think the the the, the possibility of using the edge of a graphene sheet as a detector mm. allows you to do some very confined nanochannels like extremely small nanochannels. And this is just, um, that, I mean, I hope we have, we have the right understanding of this, but I'm, yeah. I'm convinced that with a, you know, that we will learn more in the next couple of years. So we can, uh, I think, I think that it's so sensitive to the, to the water that it really could be used as a bio, you know, biochemical and, and pH is so important in biology that. Yeah, that's, that's work packet four. Yeah. Okay, yeah. fantastic. Yeah. No, but I, but I really uh, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm glad that you know, I, I got I got the thing. I mean, that's okay. why I actually. I mean, uh, yeah. That that we'll we'll see what happens. But uh, it, it, amino acids, you know, are just dived into this uh, nest of stuff. Uh, amino acids have been have been used for uh, ferroelectric switching for a while. So you can make thin films of amino acids and then uh, use them as a ferroelectric uh, device. And people are you know, looking at pretty crazy applications on this. So, so biomolecules are pretty relevant for ferroelectricity. And so I'm curious to see what happens if you let some of those polar molecules out. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things about this, especially because such molecules would normally be surrounded by water, which is polar. So would, you know, were you able to see anything from, except for the water background? And how do we deal with that? That's a ton of things that we, we don't know how to do. Okay. Um, but uh, um, I think that the, it's just as such, I mean, I've, like a real amateur, I've been trying to make molecular electronics devices for a long while. And, and I had a whole project that was about this and we made tiny electrodes, but it's so difficult to control these dimensions by, by top down. But the, this, the elegant solution is to pick something that is already small. So people are doing similar things with carbon nanotubes. But with this device, you don't need two electrodes close to each other. You just have a single, edge 
and it 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 you know the devices we made are five micron in size yeah that's gigantic think mm -hmm. about the, how few water molecules are sitting around the perimeter yeah. but all the experiments that jose did you know so, kept on pointing in the same direction that it they, these are really the molecules sitting at the edge mm -hmm. which is doing uh which is creating this effect there's a question from uh, jaime ferrer yeah well thank you very much i have actually more than one but they are very short so the first one is how small are your pores could you make your pores be so what would be the minimum radius uh, realistically yeah uh, i would say that we could make the pores uh, maybe a, a little bit less than 10 nanometer i would say maybe eight nanometer or something like that so you cannot go to down to three or four nanometers right uh, not with uh, the sort of conventional electron beam lithography because um, when I say can't, I just say that at the moment there exists no route for electron beam lithography to, appro to approach that uh, range. Because the thing is that the, 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 the sort of the, the killer for EBM lithography is um, secondary electron scattering, which means that once the electrons pass through anything, any object whatsoever, doesn't matter which element it is, that it will emit secondary electrons and they irradiate, they resist and they have a range of five to 10 uh, nanometer. That means that the, there's a halo around, you can make the beam one nanometer in size, but there's a halo of secondary electrons that is sort of giving you the effective, the effective um, diameter of the interaction. That means that once you get below 10 nanometer, you're really riding on a razor edge. It's, it's hard to do something regular and reproducible that is smaller than 10 nanometer, no matter what instrument you have. And that's due to the scattering effects in the, in the in solid which is a all atoms have electrons yeah, so there's just no material you can choose that, that doesn't do this okay so my second question would be could you passivate so sorry is this oxygen passivation stable in air and room temperature and yeah could you passivate with say hydrogen or carboxylic or we haven't tried hydrogen not, yeah sorry i'm interrupting or hydroxyl or carboxyl atoms or i mean it's just oxygen no uh this is just because we knew how to do that uh, the thing is that when you make an, an oxygen based edge you nearly always end with oxygen on the edges and when you do a floor uh, a fluorine based edge you end with fluorine that's why because most groups they use fluorine edge so that means that they haven't seen this hysteresis because the fluorine uh you know eliminates it the, the motor molecules can't bind to the fluorine it's like it has teflon on the side so uh, but it is really very rich. I mean, to, to, to not just have this, I mean, everybody is doing these kind of a, or the Fenerbahce structures all use the same, same two or three edges and they all re, uh, result in fluorine sitting on the graphene edge. So they've never seen this effect. That's why we, we tried, you know, we uh, had an oxygen based edge and tried that and then poop, suddenly it popped up. So I think it's really rich. It's just an accident that people happen to use a Teflon-ish uh, edge termination. Hydrogen is interesting, but there are a ton of other things you could bind to the edge and create more specific uh, interaction, which is relevant for label-free sensing, is relevant for making more sophisticated control of your charge distribution at the edge, yeah. which is determinant for many of the cool electronic and also spintronic properties that we might uh, be interested in. Okay, so, so thank you very much, Peter, for, for this uh, nice talk. and. Uh, I will try to be a little bit more uh, strict on the on the questions. I couldn't see it in the chat. Um, so uh, thank you, and and uh, let's move uh, quickly on to the next talk by uh, Michel Calamé. Uh, and um, the title of the talk is "Interfacing Nanoscale Materials and Device Architectures." And uh, without further ado, please, Michel. Uh, Thank you very much, Matt, for the introduction. Thank you also for uh, to, to all of you guys for organizing the session. It's it's great to have a chance to join. Uh, yeah, as Peter said, I guess somewhere virtually in the cyberspace. Uh, it's great to have this 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 chance here. So I would like to tell you a little bit um, uh, what what we have been trying to do in the in the past years on uh, integrating essentially nanoscale materials in, uh, in in nanostructures. And we saw beautiful examples of how patterning can be can be helping to go there. And maybe if one tries to maybe show a vision of, of what you know, an ideal device could be, this, this uh, sketch here 
could, could try to represent that, right? The, ultimately, what we would like to do is to position one single atom exactly where we want to have it, right? Each atom does matter, we, we, and we would like to be able to control that. And this is not an easy feature, but since about 10 years, we have been seeing a, a wonderful techniques developing, uh, and this is taken from the, the, the group of Michelle Simons now, and you see this beautiful quantum, uh, uh, quantum dots that she's able to do in epitaxial silicon using this uh, phosphine uh, based lithography that is based on, on STM. So that really opens this, this what, what we, a lot of us want to do essentially to try to design quantum states atom by atom, right? We want to be able to do that by positioning the atoms exactly, exactly where we want them to be. And this is not something which is easy. Obviously it goes back to these early uh, beautiful pictures that we all know from Don Eigler and, and showing how one can position atoms. But this is a sequential technique, first of all, based on STM. And it has this drawback of, of being slow in a sense. And there's something else. If one tries or wants to try ultimately to go to devices, that means also operation to higher temperatures than, than 4 Kelvin, uh, aspects like segregation, diffusion, repositioning of these atoms will have to be taken into account. And this is not something that is easy to do. And I think we heard it on the difficulty of controlling the edges before already, right? So this is something that, that, that we should take into account. Now, if we want to have systems that essentially are really, or systems that offer us the possibility to know exactly where the atoms are, where they stand, do you still see my screen? Yes. The right, the right, the right display there. Okay, good. I think there was a there was a swap here. Okay, let me let me just continue like this. It looks fine for me. Good. So then I just continue like this. Perfect. So one, one thing that we can use is to have precise arrangements of atoms, and these are these are these type of uh, of objects which I show here, right? This, this type of 0D or 1D components, nanotubes, nanowires, and maybe also graphene nanoribbons, which I would like to emphasize here, right? And this is the, the objects which, which I'm also interested in. So in a sense, one question that one can have here is, is, is there any possibility here to try to combine these type of objects where we know that we have a precise arrangement of these atoms, and can we just try to use those ones and combine them? So this is just a way of trying to, to, uh, to put these this systems there. And that's why I want to show you here, this is what we have in this kind of, uh, of systems. I want to show you three examples of what we have been doing. First, trying to control the formation of molecular change in C2. This is what, uh, what we have here, uh, what is shown here. And then the second type of device, what I would like to show you is, is multi-molecule junctions, which are done using graphene electrodes. And the final example is that I would like to show you is how we have been integrating graphene nanoribbons into, uh, into such uh, systems here. I'm having a problem with my screen here. And I apologize for that. All right, good. So the first example I want to show you here is the, is the break junctions uh, that, that we have been using to try to contact these type of chains. And you, and you know, this is the example of the, of the Magare Bouquet in Amsterdam. You know this type of objects or this type of, um, of bridges we can open and close. So I think the, the, the break junction is simply at the atomic scale, essentially the same type of, uh, of device or of system we want to open and close atomic scale contacts uh, and try to trap the molecule. Michel, I don't know if the screen is uh, correct. Um, I, the, the slide didn't change. I still see this atomic precise uh, slide. Okay, let me restart the sharing. I apologize about that. I'm in projection mode at the moment. Is this the correct screen that you see? Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. So the first example is about trapping molecules between atomic scale contact. And if one think about, about this, this is a process which is fairly dynamic, right? Try, trying to put a molecule into such a system here and trying to know exactly the geometry here. This is gonna be maybe fine at, at low temperatures, but knowing exactly what happens at room temperature is more complicated. And a lot of reorganization will take place. And also aspects that, or points that will take place is for instance, the fact that we will have the motion of molecules. I'm taking here an example of an, for tip, an AFM tip, which is pulling on molecules and you see that this sliding effect 
of the molecules that goes towards this position here at the apex of the tip and the substrate, this is one of the effects that will take place. The mobility of these molecules is to be taken into account. And maybe one thing can, like this can happen here, that essentially gold atoms will be also uh, moved or repositioned. And this is a study which we had done also in collaboration with Damien Thompson at, at Limerick, where we have shown that when we have molecules which are deposited on a substrate, they re-sculpt, they reorganize the surface. That means we are changing the position of the atoms. If we change the position of the atoms, we will have an effect on the transport properties. So we were trying to see how can one bring order into such systems. And what we, we, we got inspired by is by looking at metal organic frameworks. And, and these type of organic systems can be extremely uh, regular, can provide crystals. Uh, metal centers can be combined with different types of organic ligands to have oxidation states that can be controlled. And if we, one tries to look at the nanoscale, it seems that it should be possible to build blocks that are extremely well organized, that really have some level of crystallinity. So we looked at what type of uh, organic ligands are involved into those. And in collaboration with Marcel Mayor and Basel, we decided to look at this type of molecules. It's a very simple molecule in principle, benzene ring, some uh, uh, residues that we have on both sides. And the key point is here, this isocyano uh, binding groups, which are highly polar. And we heard about the importance of polarity uh, before, I think also. So by looking at, by having this type of polar groups here, we had uh, slightly different behavior. So the first observations which we made, and these are the, the standard uh, conductance versus extension in the break junction traces upon opening uh, the, the break junctions. And now this is a 2D histogram showing these conductance traces, two individual traces as shown here. And you see that we have two plateaus showing us the presence of the molecules. First observation was here, we have a very high yield. And normally when you try to trap a single molecule in a junction, the yield is fairly low. It's actually a sign that you are trying to, to work with single objects. So we were first puzzled by that. The second thing that we were observing is these two conductance values, which were appearing here. And for this system uh, so far, it, has, it had not been seen. So we're trying to make sense of that, thinking about different possibilities. Do we have molecules in parallel? Do we have multiple binding configurations uh, taking place into that system? Do we have switching maybe between two different possible arrangements of the molecule within the junction here that would lead to very different uh, conductance value? You see that we have quite a difference in conductance here. Pi pi stacking maybe, uh, different rectifications could be coming here. But if we look carefully at the breaking distance here, you see that it doesn't seem to be impossible to have actually two molecules in series. So could it be that we have a chaining for these molecules, right? And I showed you before the fact that when we have a strong binding group and this isocyano binding group is also stronger than sulfur in terms of the, of the strength of the binding, then it, can, it is possible to sort of pull away a gold atom from the, from the electrode. Because if you think about a molecule, let me show you the structure of the molecule again here, right? If you look at this molecule, it does not make sense to try to be making a chaining. Chemically, there's no way that the end of the molecule here can bind to the end of this molecule of the next molecule. We cannot make it, no. The organic chemists will, will just laugh if a physicist comes inside the air, right? It's just impossible. So we need something in between. We could have dipole-dipole interaction and maybe a stacking of these two dipoles. That could be something but certainly not just a chain. So we need, we need a gold atom in between, at least one to make this uh, possible. And if you look at crystallography, there, there is evidence indeed that these type of structures could form. And here is the gold atom in this structure here. Uh, and here's this isocyano type of binding that, that was shown in, this, in these early papers here. So again, the, the fact that add atoms can play a role in, in molecular junctions, this also has been observed by, by, by uh, Ed Cleary and Linda Zotti and others here, shown in this paper here. So there is, there is a hint, or there was this feeling that these add atoms could play a role here. And there's also this beautiful work about the role of, of, of add atoms moving around, uh, for instance, around Jeremy Baumberg uh, measured here in this optomechanics cavity. So, so this type of, of motion in the junction can play a role. So we, we assumed that this could be the case and we said, fine, if we can have two molecules in series, can we have three? So we started to look for a signature in our data if, if this was existing. And indeed we noticed that in about 29% of the traces, we could observe a signature at a lower conductance that could correspond to the fact that we would have now three molecule in series. So then we talked to our favorite uh, uh, theorists to get help from them. Uh, Jaime Ferrer, uh, that, that we just heard before. Hello, Jaime. 
uh, uh, just help us a lot on the theory and we did some DFT and negative calculations to try to estimate this. And you see the calculations done for the three different geometries here, the monomer, the dimer and the trimer and the transmission at Fermi, which is shown here. And if we try to plot our data and look at, at how it behaves, so this is the log of the conductance as a function of the number of, of, of units that we have into the, into the molecule, essentially the length of the molecule, if you want. And we see that this is the trend that we observe from our data. If we just look at the conductance of these plateaus here, and this is the prediction from the theory for one atom in series or for two atoms in series between the electrons. And you see that it seems to match with one atom in this case here. So the next question was, okay, it seems that this is, this is what is happening. We have several molecules within the junction. They can pull a gold atom and another molecule can sneak in and start to be putting a chain like this, right? So can we control this process, this oligomerization, if you want, or uh, that is taking place into the junction? So two directions that we have been trying to test uh, for that. First, we change the concentrations of the molecular compounds. And this is shown here, starting from a concentration around 100 micromolar in the solution that we had, we went down to one micromolar and to 10 nanomolar. And you see indeed that the signature is totally changing here, right? And we end up here with a signature which is at a lower um, conductance and also which is much more inclined here, much less clear plateau. The other way to do this, I showed you that we had side residues on the molecules. And so the other way to do this is to essentially say, can I have side groups, which make sure that the molecule will take more space inside the junction. So if I have a more bulky object, the probability that it finds a neighboring molecule is gonna be lower. And you see that indeed, if we increase the size of the side group here, and here an even more bulky side group, we get exactly the same effect that we are losing these two, the, 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 um, the apparition of these two plateaus here, that we are losing the chaining effect, and that we have a response that looks very similar to what we have when we decrease the concentration. Note that the concentration is kept constant here, right? We, we stick to the same concentration that we had here. So there are two ways to control that. Decrease the number of molecules present around the junction, or just make sure that one molecule occupies a larger space uh, around that. So that's, that seems really now to, to make sense that we can control this oligomerization in this system. And if we look a little bit at the conductance values now that we observe here, which in principle would be more something like a real single molecule junction or very few molecules junctions, then we get conductance values in this case that are more in agreement with all the values that were shown. That means here, it's not a single molecule, which is controlling the transport, right? This is one of the learnings here. Okay, so this is for this part of the story. And, and I try to show you here on, on, on that study that we could really control this a bit better now what is happening in the formation of these junctions and how these objects are getting together. Let me switch gears and show you another uh, um, uh, type of devices that, that we are doing in the lab. And uh, the inspiration comes from many years ago also, and I cite here, for instance, this, this paper by, by, by Manu Lurcher, where, where we were discussing at the time to, to set up a, a European project. And the motivation was to say, let's try to go coplanar. It's very hard to know what happens when we have bulky gold electrodes. Can we go coplanar? flats, we could maybe even bring a tip at some point on top of such an experiment. And can we use binding groups that are not, first of all, can you use graphene electrodes to be coplanar? And instead of using uh, a covalent binding, can we use pi stacking in order to, to bridge that? And can we have a concept where we can really control a little bit these type of junctions in this system? For that, we need to, to get graphene nanogaps. We need to be able to uh, uh, trap the molecules in between. And this is not easy. We just heard it again before, right? Patterning graphene down to the scale of one to two nanometers gap, it's a, it's a complicated endeavor. So the way we did that is that we followed up on, on previous studies, which we had also on the electromigration in gold and used the same type of idea to try to ramp up a voltage until there is a breakdown. And you see here a graphene image and you see that there's a breakdown here. There is some more damage in this case here. But the idea was to try to generate here a gap into this system. And this process starts to work better and better in order to be able to make these graphene nano gaps. And many groups have been using uh, this now. And you see, for instance, that uh, before on the blue scale here, you have the, the, the current measured across such a graphene constriction before the breakdown. And after the breakdown, you see that we get this type of tunneling traces. So we can make this type of nano gaps. Size is a couple of nanometer range. That means we have now electrodes that we can use to control the molecules. Now, 
graphene will grow weak. Graph graphene is a is an is a system that is not so so easy to to manipulate because it's sitting really on the surface and it's extremely sensitive to the environment. So the quality of graphene, the presence of wrinkles of residues, is something that one should be careful with. Substrate can also play a role there. Uh, switching effects can be observed. Um, the geometry of the edges uh, is something that is not easy to control uh, and, and can also lead to specific effects. And there are more aspects which are not so easy in this context. The formation of carbon chains, for instance, or, or um, other types of variability which can enter. So, so man, you know, using the graphene as a contact electrode is not something which is so easy. We're still motivating to do it also in the context of other studies which we are interested in, namely looking at thermoelectric effects. And coplanar geometries like this have the potential to be quite interesting to try to introduce the effects of phonon filtering, for instance, into this geometry. So if I really want to try to, to improve the thermoelectric effect into this type of devices, one important thing would be able to, cap to be capable to get a temperature gradient here. And if we control the phonon transport here, that will be important. And that might be possible to do by trying to have phonon density of states, which are fairly different between the contact electrode and the molecule which we want to, to connect here. And this drawing is taken from this publication here. And people have been calculating here a number of effects in, in these type of structures, trying to exploit this type of effects and indeed improve thermoelectric energy conversion uh, might be possible using that. So we said we want to try to really have these coplanar electrodes and put molecules. So we started with different types of molecules. You see here one molecule which we tried that's coming from, from a Shlomo a group, Shlomo Itzai's group at Huji. And we try that, but what we observe is that as soon as we try to increase the temperature in these systems, then the molecules start to become very mobile. This is also the same point I was trying to do with the bread junction before, right? At room temperature, things move around and it's really not so easy to stabilize the thing. You see that the IV characteristics go everywhere here. So that's not satisfying. So how can we try to design a system that is more stable? That was a little bit the endeavor which we were uh, trying to do. So the very simple idea was to say, why don't we try to make a stack. I showed you before that getting a single molecule junction is not something trivial for the break junction. You saw the size of the gaps we have here, a couple of nanometers. So the probability that we have only a single molecule is probably not very high. And also the width of these uh, trenches, which we make in graphene, is fairly wide. So we will have many molecules, at least in parallel, potentially also in series. So one naive point was to say, well, why don't we build a bridge of molecules, essentially, right? So taking this very simple picture of, of depicting here the pi or the overlap between the pi orbitals that I might have here in a conjugated system, uh, that, that could be a very nice pathway for the electrons. If I manage to get my molecules close enough that these uh, neighboring orbitals are overlapping. Now I still have the point on how to build that or the problem on how to build that and trying to build something like this at the nanoscale, um, that sounds not so trivial to do, although some people did beautiful structures in some cases. But we thought more simply, let's just try to bind the molecules to the substrate. So uh, we talked again to our favorite chemists in Basel and they, uh, um, and they designed different types of molecules. In this case, we had molecules also coming from, from different collaborators. And this is the design which we used here. You see this type here of, of uh, conjugated units that is there bound potentially to the substrate. There's a silicon atom here potentially bound potentially to the substrate using this carbon chain. So no conductance along this pathway here or no strong delocalization of the electrons, but here a pi system. So we tried with that system and you see here measurements done with this type of junctions with these two types of molecules here. First of all, only the blue units, you see that the IV type of characteristics which we get are fairly superposing on top of each other. And here we go, this is what we observe if we take the green molecule here this type of behavior. So the conductance is increasing, the current is increasing in the devices, but we start to face the similar problem that I showed you before. It seems to be quite, quite noisy. And it's not really noise, it's simply that we have probably a lot of reconfiguration into those junctions. So how do we do that, right? Then we just thought, well, but then that means that the overlap between these molecules here is not sufficient. The pi stacking is not strong enough to mechanically stabilize. It seems the molecules bind to the substrate, they attach, but they still move around too much and reorganize too much. So we can try to make sense of this type of approach and try to identify microscopic states, conform conformation, if you want, of these of, of arrangements that, that corresponds to a well-defined 
mechanical arrangement of the molecules and try to calculate those systems. And here maybe machine learning type of approaches could be useful for that. So try to classify and cluster the data in a way that can make sense. But you see that it's complicated then to go back and say, but what is exactly the microscopic state here? Can we stabilize it a bit further? And this is what we did. We just added additional uh, uh, pi systems here to try to increase the pi overlap. And this was the observation then of, the, uh, of, of these systems. So it seems that by increasing simply this overlap, this, pi, this stacking here, we were able to stabilize those junctions. And I think the, 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 the naive feeling here that, that we have is that, first of all, we have to control the, the, the mechanics of these systems to some level, at least to understand, to try to find systems that can have an energy minimum such that they will stabilize in that energy minimum. And then we can try to study the transport properties in a bit more serene way. Otherwise, we will have to explore such a large uh, phase, such a large space of parameters that it will be complicated. So the trick of, of binding to the substrate mechanically and trying to control uh, the overlap here for the electronic properties, but also for the mechanical properties seems to, to, to help to, to get there. So that was for this second type of devices, which I wanted to show. And in the last part of the presentation, I would like to now move towards graphene nanoribbons and all the types of junctions we have been doing. So let me briefly remind you uh, one or two points about these graphene nanoribbons. We do not make them. We are, we are lucky to have this collaboration with the, the, the lab of Roman Fasel. This is where we get the nanoribbons and they come in different flavors. You can have zigzag type of edges here. As shown here, you can have the armchair type of edges for these ribbons. And you can have also the chiral uh, type of uh, systems here shown in the three different colors. So for instance, here, here are a couple of different nanoribbons. Uh, my screen just froze. I hope it's not gonna last too long. Okay, no. There we go. I don't know if you see that, but I'm having that my PowerPoint wants to restart. <laughs> Apologies for that. Uh, but... All right, so my PowerPoint seems to be back again. Let me go back to the proper slide. There we go. So you see here a couple of examples of these different types of nano ribbons, five carbon atoms that are here. So five, the five AGNRs will be those ones here, right? If we count the atoms starting here, one, two, three, four, and five atoms here seven, nine, and so on and so forth. And then the length of this uh, nanoribbon is also given in the number of repeating units that, that one ha has there. So the interesting thing is that those objects are again synthetic objects where the, essentially the size can be controlled, not the length. This is not so easy to do, but the width can be very well controlled by uh, choosing the appropriate precursors to get there. And that means that a lot of control on the electronic properties can also be achieved like that. And this is illustrated in this uh, early papers by, by the group of uh, Marvin Cohen, Stephen Louis, for instance, where they calculated the different electronic structures of these objects here. So those units, those, those systems provide a lot of possibilities to, to tune them. And it's really amazing what can be done if I show you here this edge type of modification that people uh, can do as well here synthetically and get really regular systems. You see the ST images are quite impressive here. Can have staggered edge extended type of structures as well. So there's a lot of control that can be done synthetically. Now, in some cases, if you look at how these systems grow up, they appear like this now in UHV in the STM. And so you start to see the difficulty here is like, how, 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 you know, how can I contact that object? It's not so easy now to go and pick it up. And obviously the STM here is one possibility to do that. One can come uh, like, like, like shown here in the group of Guillaume Schul, one can, can come with the tip and go and contact it or Nacho Pascual have beautiful measurements on this type of system. But then we end, we end up back in conditions that are okay for UHV, flow temperatures and very sequential. So the integration in a device is not so easy. And Jeff Bokor at Berkeley has been doing that now since a few years where they have integrated this, this graph in nano ribbons. But now we start to face again a similar type of problems which I mentioned to you about positioning control of the contacting and being sure that we can correlate structure 
and transport properties in a way that that, that makes sense. So one of the things that that uh, we have been working on together with the uh, the people making the growth here is: is it possible to grow these graphene nanoribbons parallel instead of having them fully disordered at the at the surface? So by using smart substrates. Uh, 778 substrates, uh, gold, uh, gold substrates, then, then it's possible to have terraces which are fairly narrow and that confines the graphene nanoribbons on, on top of those terraces and that helps to get them uh, self-aligned. So this is, this is a lot of help then we can do this delamination of the, of the graphene nanoribbons to transfer them on top of devices. And obviously we can look first of all at the graphene nanoribbons on the gold and do Raman spectroscopy directly on gold. Uh, and this is what is uh, uh, shown in some cases here, that, that it's possible to do this graphene lithography, but we are also interested into knowing and being sure that after transfer, after doing this, this electrochemical delamination on a substrate, the graphene nanoribbons are still the way they were growing, that we did not destroy them. And this is important to do. So uh, Raman spectroscopy is an important uh, uh, tool, and I will get back to this in one minute now. So starting there, what type of devices were we doing? We use these graphene electrodes and we transfer this film of graphene nanoribbons. So that's important to realize that there's many of these nanoribbons in parallel in, in the system. We don't, just don't have one, right? And, and honestly, the question is, because I like bridges, here's the second bridge, right? Uh, uh, what, what is really in the device? And, and you know, we, what, what we are trying to do is to, you know, a bridge over troubled water, essentially, because we have the substrate in the back here. This is not floating. And that means the silicon dioxide or whatever is left here will play, will have a strong influence on the electronic properties of those nanoribbons. So we are blind here. We don't really know exactly how the substrate is affecting this, which means we really need these spectroscopy tools to go investigate what's happening. And this is what we do using Raman spectroscopy. So, so what we can do, for instance, using this Raman spectroscopy here, and this is on the growth substrate that I show you this, this spectrum here, we first can identify the type of graphene nanoribbons that you have. And you see here Raman spectra for three different types of, of nanoribbons, five, seven, and nine. And by looking at this radial breathing like mode, so it's not, it's not a, you know, it, it, this is coming obviously from, from, from carbon nanotubes. It's not a breathing mode like the carbon nanotube here. It's simply a vibrational mode that is also going across the width of the, of the system. So it's a radial breathing like mode, if you want. At least this is the way people call it in, in literature. So you see that we can identify the type of nanoribbon that we have. We can also assess sample to sample variation. For instance, here, four different types of devices are shown where we can just make sure that after that on the growth substrate, these nanoribbons are okay. So this is the first step that we have to do. And then after that, we go to the electrodes. Uh, this is graphene electrodes, which are patterned. And then uh, I will ask Peter Bergil not to look too much carefully because I'm ashamed to show those structures, even if there's a beautiful effort already to make these gaps, but we have been seeing beautiful structures before as well. So you see our gaps are a bit more modest than what you can do. We still did a lot of effort here and I think there's a great work that has been done to, to achieve this type of systems. But you see that we have quite some wide uh, um, uh, uh, const graphene constrictions which have been built and gaps which are about in, the, in this range of 25 nanometers here. So we can do polarized measurements in our Raman spectrometer. And this is shown here. And with that, it allows us to really check along what axis our nano, nano, uh, um, nano ribbons are aligned. And you see that depending on how we deposit them, we can have a deviation here. And this type of pole figures allows us to, uh, to really check the alignment of the ribbons along the main axis here of the contact electrodes. So pushing a bit, Raman spectroscopy or checking what has been done, we can really identify the different modes that are, that are present here in these, in these systems and we can try to assign them. And, and when trying to really understand better what was going on, we have been looking a bit more at lower energies here. And there is one mode that attracted our attention or surprised us, which we were not used really to, to, to look at here, around 100 centimeters minus one or 12 milli electron volts. And this low frequency mode was not really documented so far. So we just called it LCM here. And we started to look a bit more in details uh, what, what's happening. So thanks to the effort of, of Jan Overbeck, Oliver Brown, also for the structures that we have here, we, we have been really investigating that a bit more carefully. And you see, for instance, that if one looks at different uh, uh, um, type of nanoribbons here, nine, seven, or, or five here, there's no big shift of the position of this peak here. So it does not seem to depend on the, on the width. It does not seem to have something to do with the number of atoms across this direction here. 
that we have. Now, if we do polarization dependent Raman spectroscopy in this case, what we observe as well is that it follows indeed the signature of the nano ribbon. So it is a mode that has to do with the nano ribbon. It is an intrinsic mode of this nano ribbon. And this is something that we can check here. That means then we had to, to, to go for help from theoreticians and in collaboration with Vincent Meunier they, Meunier, they did a lot of uh, calculations for that. And we came up to the conclusion that this is most probably a longitudinal compressive mode that we observe here. And this is illustrated in this system here. And you see here some measurements that we had and we were puzzled by the fact that we had several peaks appearing. Now, if we see here the calculations done by, by the group of, uh, of Vincent Meunier here, you see that for four units, or six units, the position of this peak will depend. That, that I think intuitively we can understand, right? If we have an object which is vibrating longitudinally like this, the, the size here will change the, the vibration energy, right? If we get shorter or longer. And obviously going shorter, we will have higher energies in, the, in this case. And you see here that these two peaks now could be attributed to two different lengths of these graphene nanoribbons. And when we discuss with the growers, they tell us, yes, we expect actually different length in the, in the system. So that seems to start to match nicely with also what was um, seen in, in STM measurements here. And then full uh, extended calculations have been done to, uh, on that to try to further investigate this, uh, this thing. So now, what I wanted to show you a bit with this Raman spectroscopy part here is to show that we, we really need to try to make sure that we know what we have on the substrate. And at least Raman is one way that is non-destructive and gives us a lot of information on, on how these nano ribbons are sitting there. That means now we can try to do some transport measurements and going back to this type of geometries here where we try to contact with the graphene electrodes, the film of nanoribbons that is transferred on the substrate. We were happy to start to see some signature of transport where we could identify what we think starts to be individual features or features of individual nanoribbons appearing, which means that probably only a few graphene nanoribbons will dominate transport across these, uh, uh, these, these uh, device here, and we observe different types of, um, of uh, Coulomb blockade type of uh, behavior in this type of systems. We start to see excitation lines. You see that we should go a bit to lower temperatures in order to get that better defined. Uh, if we just increase the temperature, these features are slowly washed out. So we start to be in a position now to really be able to measure transport into this type of systems, and this is what we are working on at the moment. We do it for this type of nano ribbons shown here, the 5 AGNRs, but we do it for more special type of nano ribbons as well, like this pyrene type of nano ribbons, where we try to really now get a signature of the different uh, um, intrinsic electronic structure of those systems. So in summary, what I try to show you for this part here is that we need, we need some way of, of really looking at how the graphene nano ribbons are behaving into those systems. And I think Raman spectroscopy more and more, we discover that we can push it to, to, to get better understanding of what's going on there. And in, in particular, this longitudinal compressive mode, I think, is potentially very interesting because it has to do with the full length of the system. Now, you can imagine that this graphene nano ribbon sitting on the substrate will interact with the substrate. And if this interaction is such that it affects the possible vibrations, it partially pins this graphene nano ribbon to the substrate, I would expect this LCM mode to be shifted in, in, in energy. And I think there we have a potential very useful tool to affect to, to you know, assess how, how the, the, uh, this interaction is taking place. And also the graphene contacts is something that we have to, to be careful with. And obviously encapsulation is one direction which we are going as well at the moment with one of the PhD students trying to use this HBN encapsulated type of systems to try to see if we can better control also what's happening in this type of, uh, of system. And this interface between the graphene and the graphene nano ribbon is also very delicate there. So that's my summary. These are the three types of devices that I was uh, trying to show you. First, these chaining effects into, into gold break junctions, and showing you that we can start to build more stable molecular junctions using graphene contact electrodes, but we have to play this trick to bind the molecule to the substrate in order to, to um, make this more stable. And finally, we are integrating graphene nanoribbons into uh, systems also using graphene-based electrodes. So those are the people that have, that have been uh, essential for this work here. Anton for the, for the measurements on the uh, isocyanotypes of molecules, Maria uh, for the graphene-based junctions, Michael, Jan, and Oliver are also key here for this. And those are the people that have been growing the nanoribbons. The modeling was done by, by Vincent, and we are grateful also to the 
uh, BRNC for accessing uh, their, their facilities and these are the collaborations which we have also here on, on these projects and a few others. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you very much, Michel. Um, um, I think uh, now time has been uh, been running quite fast here. So uh, uh, maybe we just have one question and then we rush on to the next one. And then maybe after the session, we can we can have some questions over lunch. Um, so that's one question from Arthur. Yeah, hi, Michel. Great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have a question on the first part on the molecular chain formation and I was surprised that the plateaus are so nicely separated in a distance. Does that yeah. mean that you really pull out first the first molecule, get, get them at them and then collect the second molecule or is that over interpretation? Well, I mean, yeah, well, you can imagine the number of hours we try to, spend to interpret this, but I, th I think the molecules are present around. So if I would have to draw the junction, I would put the two tips and several molecules being present. And at some point when we break the gold neck, the molecule will start to go into and be present into the, into the system, right? But other molecules are around as well. So you saw it's, if, if one of the gold atoms is being pulled away from the surface, it's, it's, there is a probability that another molecule will just follow also this motion and come in. We have a couple of videos uh, by, by Jaime Ferres that are from the, the calculations that I could have been showing, but I didn't dare to put it in the, uh, in the presentation, I must say. And, and this type of effect is also seen in, in, the, in the calculation. So, so we think indeed that, that as this isocyano group can pull a gold atom, it, it, it also creates a high probability that the molecule can come in. Okay. And this is, okay. I, th I think the control experiments tend to support this, uh, this interpretation because if we start to put side groups, for instance, that make sure that the neighboring molecules are much further apart, then you see that the effect is, is killed. We don't see this chaining effect anymore. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Michel. Uh, we have to rush to the next talk. And uh, this is... Um, by uh, Michel Pitrucero. And uh, the title of the talk is Quantum Electronic Transport Across Byte Defects. Okay, so please. Thanks a lot. Can you see the screen? Okay. Yes. Fantastic. So, well, first of all, let me thank you for this uh, nice opportunity and also for getting the all of us together, at least uh, virtually. So, in the next 15 minutes, I will try to uh, give you some overview about our work on byte defects in graphene nanoribbons. So here is the outline of my presentation. I will be starting by briefly reviewing something that Michel has mentioned before, which is the on-surface synthesis of graphene nanoribbons. And next, uh, I will discuss the emergence of byte defects in this bottom-up graphene nanoribbons and also their impact on uh, the electronic transport properties of the armature edges. I will spend a few words uh, about making comparison between byte defects in armature and zigzag nanoribbons, and finally I will try to wrap up our uh, findings and also to uh, spend some words about other projects which I believe are very much within the scope of, uh, of this session. So uh, the big twist in the context of the realization of graphene nanoribbons came approximately uh, 10 years ago when it was realized that you can produce uh, these nanostructures with a bottom-up approach. So the idea is conceptually uh, straightforward. You start from a precursor molecule, you perform Ullmann type coupling and you end up with this intermediate product, which upon cyclo dehydrogenation converts into the final uh, nanoribbons. And the main um, advantages of this uh, strategy is twofold. On the one hand, you end up with nanoribbons which are atomically precise on the edges. So the electronic structure is fully preserved. Or it's almost entirely preserved against the disorder. And second, depending on the initial precursor molecule you have, you may tune the uh, width of the nanoribbon as well as the edge geometry. So you may realize a really great variety of nanoribbons, including chevron, chiral nanoribbons, armchair, and, and zigzag, which are uh, those I will be mostly uh, talking about, I mean, armchair and zigzag. So armature graphene nanoribbons are probably the most uh, appealing uh, for uh, graphene electronics uh, because the energy gap uh, scales with the width of the nanoribbon itself. And in particular, if we quantify the width of the number of the nanoribbon as the number of the carbon atoms uh, across the nanoribbon direction, we can distinguish three situations depending on whether this value n belongs to the 3p, 3p plus one, or 3p plus two family. 
Now for the 3P and 3P plus 1 family, we have a semiconducting behavior, while for the 3P plus 2 family, we have a metallic behavior or a quasi-metallic behavior, depending on the level of theory you, you adopt. Uh, so um, this is very uh, typical uh, STM image of a bunch of S syn as synthesized um, arch graphene nanoribbons with a width of nine atoms. And what you can uh, observe is that uh, at the edges of these nanoribbons, you have some vacancy uh, defects. And uh, you can resolve these uh, special types of defects through atomic force microscopy. And as you can see here, these defects mostly consist of missing benzene rings at the edge of the nanoribbon, and we have named these defects as uh, bite defects. Now, despite defects form during the cyclo, uh, the hydrogenation step of the reaction synthesis when uh, one phenyl or in general one alkyl benzene group cleaves, and, and they, and they uh, form in the final product. So if we want really to uh, use graphene nanoribbons in the, for electronic devices, we have to understand what is the impact of these defects on, on the charge transport. And to this end, we have performed first principles calculations. So um, we have started from a very um, simple model in which we have a single byte defect, which is uh, contained in 9AG and R, and we have calculated a zero bias conductance spectrum for the system with and without the byte defect. So it can be clearly seen that um, this byte defect strongly disrupt the conductance at the band edges. And in order to quantify this disruption of the conductance, we have introduced a descriptor tau which uh, basically accounts for the amount of conductance that is retained in the nanoribbon once you introduce uh, the bias defect. Now, um, this uh, value of tau is uh, defined in a very straightforward way, simply the uh, ratio between the areas below the defective system and the pristine system within uh, approximately point, point 0.1 electron volts. And in the case of a 9 GNR, you have that this value of tau is approximately 26%, which means that once you introduce a single byte defect, uh, almost more than 70% of the conductance at the band edge is gone, is killed. And this is also uh, reflected in the ID characteristics that are uh, calculated here, in which the introduction of the byte defects basically affects uh, the currents by reducing them uh, by approximately one order of magnitude at finite uh, IS voltages. What is even worse for electron transport is that byte defects do not stay isolated, but they have a strong tendency to cluster. And this can be quantified experimentally in terms of a pair distribution function, which gives you uh, the probability of finding a, pair, uh, finding a pair of byte defects at a relative distance d. So we have obtained this uh, uh, edge-resolved uh, pair distribution function, which tells us uh, the amount of defects at a given distance forming either at the same edge in the top panel or the opposite edges at the lower panel. And uh, it's pretty much clear that this byte defect exhibit a strong tendency to cluster within approximately two, uh, two nanometers. And we have uh, accounted for this situation um, from first principles calculations in a quite systematic way in which we have uh, considered configurations of uh, pairs of byte defects in which the second byte defect is introduced as increasing distance from the first one. And this gives rise to the alpha, beta, gamma, delta, or epsilon uh, configurations depending on the, on the distance between the two defects. And we have done this either for defects at the same or opposite edges, and for each of these configurations, we have obtained the conductance of the pristine system, which is the black line, of the system containing a single byte defect, which is the blue area, and of the system containing two byte defects, which is the red line. So the bottom line here is that uh, double defects further decrease the conductance at the band edges, and again, we can quantify this in terms of this parameter tau that I was mentioning before, which tells us the amount of conductance that is retained in the defective uh, nanostructures. So uh, for pairs of byte defects at uh, the same edge, which are the uh, red line here, tau ranges between uh, 18 and 4%, depending on the specific defect configuration. Whereas for uh, byte defects forming at opposite edges, tau is approximately constant and it's about 2%. So, uh, what is really bad about these byte defects in terms of electronic transport is that they kill the conductance uh, almost entirely at the band edges. So if we really want to use nine AGNRs to, uh, for electronic applications, I think, or in general, if you want to use AGNRs for electronic applications, I think we have to find uh, some strategies to uh, mitigate this very detrimental role of the byte defects on the charge transport. So what we have suggested is that we can increase the width of the hosting arbitrary gas nanoribbon. And um, especially uh, we have obtained tau as a function of the width and 
uh, that uh, of the width and of uh, the AGNR. So there are at least two trends we can identify from this figure. So first of all, as the width of the nanoribbon increases, also tau increases, and eventually you can recover approximately 80 or 90 percent of the conductance at the band extrema if the armchair graph nanoribbon has more than uh, 20, is more than 20 atoms wide. Second, we can observe that uh, AGNRs that belong to the Filippi family are the most sensitive to the defects, and we can. We still don't have very clear uh, ideas why it's so, but what we have suggested is that this may trace back to localization effects. And in particular, if you look at the local density of states at the band edges in each of the defective family, we have that in the 3 family, localization effects play a major role as compared to the other families of, of nanoribbons. And so this may be the origin of this enhanced uh, disruption of the band, of the, of the conductance uh, problem. I also would like to mention that byte defects are uh, not only uh, restricted to armchair graphene nanoribbons, but we have observed these defects also in the zigzag edges. Uh, similarly to the armchair edges, we have that byte uh, defects occur during the cycle of the hydrogenation step of the on surface synthesis. However, contrary to AGNRs, we have that these byte defects do not consist of a missing benzene ring, but they consist of a missing metaxylene uh, fragment here. And this is just because of the very nature of the precursor molecule, but nevertheless, we were able to image these defects through atomic force microscopy uh, very clearly. So you can see that these this byte defects in the zigzag edges may uh, even be isolated or may also uh, be uh, together, like in this uh, bottom part. Again, we have studied the electronic structure around these uh, byte defects in the zigzag edges. And the first remarkable result is that the introduction of these byte defects in the zigzag edges breaks the lattice imbalance. And this means that they introduce a local magnetic moment, which is uh, two Bob magnetons. So you basically remove a uh, different number of carbon atoms from the A and B sublattices. So again, we have that uh, the introduction of these byte defects uh, decreases the conductance, but uh, given the sublattice imbalance, the conductance that is broken, the conductance for the spin up and spin uh, down uh, channel uh, is different. And this in turn is reflected in the IV characteristics in which you may achieve uh, spin polarized currents with a spin polarization that is approximately 20% for, uh, for a bias voltage of one volt. Uh, this means that uh, even though uh, byte defects are bad overall for the conductance of zigzag nanoribbons, they may be used, for instance, in the context of spintronics when you typically need, you typically need uh, spin polarized currents. So uh, with this, I'd like to move to the uh, take home message of this uh, presentation of the core of this presentation, which I hope I convinced that byte defects are really everywhere in the bottom-up synthesis of graphene nanoribbons. Uh, doesn't matter which edge you pick, uh, whether it's armchair or zigzag, they may be different in atomic structures, but still you have these vacancy defects that are present at the edges, which in turn have a very detrimental role on the charge transport by disrupting the conductance at the band edges and decreasing the, the currents in the IV characteristics. In the case of the zigzag nanoribbons, these defects are magnetic. Uh, but in the case of the armchair, they, they are just bad. They are useless. So it's important to find some strategies to mitigate their role. And this can be achieved by increasing the width of the nanoribbon. So I think I have a few minutes more, which I'd like to spend uh, by discussing other, uh, by discussing two slides, just two slides about other projects on electronics with graphene that we have been done, at least from uh, the theoretical point of view. And the first one is about uh, quantum dots in armchair graphene nanoribbons. And this was a project that was mostly motivated by this uh, observation in which you have two uh, armchair graphene nanoribbons that are different in length that you can fuse together, giving rise to this weak modulated AGNR. So we have studied this null structure in the most systematic way in which our models consist of a quantum dot uh, of width M and of length L that is contacted to a pair of semi-infinite metallic leads of width, of width n, where n is taken uh, to belong to the 3p plus 2 family in order to ensure its metallic character, which is what we typically want for, for the leads. What is special about this, uh, this uh, quantum dots is that uh, we have studied the evolution of the transport gap as a function of the length of the quantum dot. And when the length of the dot exceeds a sort of critical length, then uh, the transport gap approaches or converges to that of the pristine M plus N AGNR, which is represented by the horizontal lines. 
which means that if you have um, M plus N uh, quantum dot that is semiconducting and the lead which is metallic, uh, then you will have just realized a self-contained metal semiconductor metal device, which is built within a single graph nanoribbons. And this may be a useful suggestion for what has been mentioning before, which is the ongoing difficulty to integrate uh, semiconducting channels of graphene nanostructures with metallic, uh, with metallic leads. And uh, finally, we have also proposed graphene nanoribbons as a chemo sensor. This is more probably a curiosity than a, than a result. But here the idea is that you have a graphene nanoribbon and you side attach um, a chain of aromatic molecules. And it doesn't matter whether this chain is a polyphenyl poly, uh, or a polyacin group, what you have in the conductance is a sort of even odd effect. In a sense that when you have an even number of rings, the conductance is fully preserved with respect to the pristine nanoribbon, whereas when you have an odd number of rings, the conductance is decreased by conductance quantum G0 as compared to the pristine nanoribbon. So in principle, one may, uh, at, of course, this does not happen in the full conductance spectrum. This just happens at specific energy, which is T, that is the hopping integral between the pi orbitals in the, in the, in the, in the carbon-based system. So overall, we have proposed that this even odd effect may be exploited for the realization of sensor in which you can somehow detect the number of aromatic rings which are attached to, uh, to, to, the, to the hosting graphene nanoribbons. So uh, I think I'm on time. So I just want to thank the people I had the pleasure to work with on these projects, especially I'd like to thank Christian at EPFL, who took care of most of the calculations I've been showing today, and also Gabriela Tempo, who uh, was responsible for the uh, nice images of defects that I've been, I've been discussed. And of course, I'd like to thank you all very much for your attention. So thank you very much, uh, Michele, for a very nice presentation. Yeah, we have uh, enough time for questions. Um, uh, there's a question from Aran. Please, Aran. Hi. Uh, Hi. Thanks, Michele, for the very nice talk. Uh, I have a question regarding the byte uh, zigzag graphene nanoribbons. Yeah. Well, it's <laughs> It's uh, maybe an experimental question, actually, because um, your your theoretical work is um, inspired by these by these uh, STM measurements. Um, for this byte uh, zigzag graphene nanoribbons, what's going on with the edge state? Ah, that's a good question. Yeah. because I know that uh, uh, these other in-dim functionalized graphene nanoribbons, you could see the zigzag edges. Um, so I don't know if you have also, not only from the experimental point of view, of whether you have uh, checked what happens with your um, bytes. So what I can tell you is that what the, the eighth picture we had in mind in the beginning is that you uh, affect just one of the two edges. So in principle, you may preserve one of the edge states on the one edge and then kill the other edge states on the other edge. But we found that the situation is way more complicated. So there is a strong interaction between the two edges so it's not like on and off on uh, one of the two edges. So there is a very strong interplay and the two edges are very entangled. And uh, we, we still don't have a very clear picture in mind about this, about what's going on in edge state. That's I would cool. expect from a purely tight binding model, the situation might be as naive as I was mentioning before. But if you move to a first principles calculation, it's uh, way more complicated. Okay, so this is, this is for, the, for the theory. You mean yeah. calculations. I cannot um, tell anything from experiments. It's okay, and um, also for the zigzag case, do you see any influence on the width of the ribbons? For the answer from the archer graphene nanoribbons, you said that the effect of this byte defect is uh, going down as the ribbon ribbons width increases. Yes, makes sense, I guess. Yeah, uh, I think so. but you said nothing about the zigzag. And yeah, no, for the zigzag, we didn't study the influence on. Uh, on, on the way, so we don't know. Uh, because okay. well, the main problem is that we have seen this byte defects in 9 GNR. People have seen this in Chevron edge types, but how this byte defect scale with the width of the nanoribbon is not very clear simply because the precursor molecule to get so wider nanoribbon may be different. So you might have different functional groups there, which may end up in a different atomic structures for the, for the, for the final structures. OK, thank you. And, uh, I have a question. Um, did you consider a transverse electrical field um, to this? I'm afraid. Sorry, say it again. So if you have the ribbon and you have your structures with a byte or you have this uh, quantum dot attached, did you consider a transverse field and the effect of that? 
No, no, we didn't. Are you referring to the half metallicity that you may have in? Yes. Uh, no, no, no. This is just uh, very preliminary results. We we didn't go so much in detail. Okay. Uh, if there are no further questions, I think we'll move on to the next speaker. Thank you again. Michelle. Thank you. And this is uh, Isaac Alcon. And the title of the talk is Quantum Interference Engineering of Nanoporous Graphene for Carbon Nanocircuitry. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you much. Um, and thank you to the, all the organizers for yeah, giving me the opportunity to present yeah, this work, uh, which, well, as you will see, is actually in, in great uh, collaboration and uh, with, with Matt uh, himself. And, you and spelled my name wrong. And no, really? Graham, <laughs> it doesn't matter. I ah, really, yeah, that's true. Okay, that's a good start. Okay. That's, that's actually true. Um, so, uh, yeah, I will correct it. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's about using quantum interference as a way to engineer uh, nanoporous graphene. So, yeah, uh, most of the people, I guess, know very well especially the organizers know very well this work by Cesar, Mugarza, Aran, Diego Peña, and, and, and so on, um, of, of the, of the bottom-up fabricated nanoporous graphene, which uh, indeed, as uh, also Peter was uh, highlighting at the beginning, uh, it has this very important uh, I think a feature that it's atomically precise as, as many of the studies that we have seen uh, during, uh, during the, the different sessions, also on Monday where, when we saw different nanoribbons uh, fabricated from a bottom-up approach. Now, from nanoelectronics, one interesting thing about this uh, nanoporous graphene also as they actually uh, uh, explained or, or uh, demonstrated in the paper with uh, transport calculations is that in the low energy regime, so the black curve is graphene, uh, you can, and then uh, then the yellow curve is the transmission in the direction of the graphene and the ribbons, and the purple curve is the transmission along the bridges. And you can see that in the low energy regime, plus minus electron volt, there is a huge difference between the transmission in the two directions. So essentially the transport is highly anisotropic in this material. And so really from, let's say, from the perspective of nanoelectronics, this in principle makes uh, nanoporous graphene uh, highly attractive for, uh, for instance, uh, carbon nanocircuitry. Because you could imagine that each graphene nanoribbon behaves as a nano channel for electrons. However, then later on, uh, Matt's uh, at DTU, he uh, started uh, modeling uh, the injection of electrons in uh, nanoporous graphene. So you can see here an image of the current going from the tip to one graphene nanoribbon. And then by using this uh, kind of developed um, a theory, so DFT parameterized type binding uh, models and combined with Prince functions, they were able to actually model this transport in, in kind of much larger devices. So instead of just hundreds of atoms, hundreds of thousands of atoms. And then essentially what happens then, as you can see here, so this, this small box is that, is that box there, which is a DFT one, and then you have a big device of the same uh, system. And you can see that essentially the current just spread through the entire thing. Um, forming this so-called Talbot interference pattern. So uh, the conclusion of this is that the nanoporous graphene cannot be used for nanocircuitry, essentially because each graphene nanoribbon does not behave as a single channel for uh, nano channel for electrons. And they uh, correlated that with uh, the so-called interchannel coupling coefficient which you can extract from the Banach structure, low energy uh, Banach structure of nanoporous graphene. So this is the Fermi level. Here you have the two transverse, transverse uh, uh, electronic bands. And the difference at a particular energy, the difference in K, tells you how coupled, electronically coupled, those uh, graphene nanoribbons, the graphene nanoribbons are in, in this material. 
So the larger the electronic coupling, the, 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 the more the stronger the spreading of the injected uh, uh, currents, electronic currents. So um, at that, when they were actually working on that, I, I, I started uh, a one, uh, my first international postdoc in his group. And um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I mean, I had a very basic knowledge on condensed, uh, ma uh, condensed matter physics, but I came from the organic chemistry community. And of course, when you see a biconjugated bond, it's kind of quite direct, uh, you know, that the electrons can go through that uh, biconjugated carbon-carbon bond. And that made me think about something that I had already worked before from the molecular perspective, which is uh, destructive quantum interference. So this is something that has been long studied in the field of single molecule uh, electronics. And essentially, the, the, the most prototypical example of that is a benzene ring. So in a benzene ring, if you connect the electrodes in this para configuration, electrons go through like uh, easily in a, in a, and, and then you get a norm, normal transmission or the maximum transmission that you can get through a single benzene ring. But if the electrodes are connected in meta configuration, then this destructive quantum interference takes place. And that normal enormously decreases the transmission through that uh, molecular device. And this has been a few times actually experimentally demonstrated. Here you have one where actually they designed these two molecules where you can see that the kind of parts of the molecule that attach to the electrodes are in this para configuration and meta configuration. And you can see that the transmissions that they get for the two cases, so the one in meta is almost 100 times uh, smaller uh, or, or lower, the, the transmission is almost 100 times uh, slow, um, a smaller or lower than the para uh, connected um, benzene, benzene ring. So it really makes an, an effect. So from uh, the, the, the first thing that we did was, okay, so how we have to design our new nanoporous graphenes to actually demonstrate this. If, you know, we could use this uh, Quantum interference, quantum interference to engineer the currents in, in these uh, materials. And essentially, it's quite direct. So we essentially said, okay, so we bridge the graphene and ribbons with benzene rings, uh, one in meta and another in para as a, as a kind of a reference point. So this, the comparison between these two will tell us if really the quantum interference is doing something. And then the comparison between, let's say, the, the para MPG and the fabricated one will also tell, uh, say something about the effect of actually having a bridge. But especially this comparison is the, it was the most relevant for us. Okay, so, uh, and then we use the same level of theory that I was uh, mentioning before to actually study this. Okay, so first, what about the electronic structure of these, of these uh, materials? So here we have the band structure of the para nanoporous graphene. And in the same, and, and these are the two uh, low energy uh, longitudinal um, bands that I was mentioning before for the fabricated uh, nanoporous graphene. And so if at a particular energy, we chose 0 0.7 electron volts, uh, that's hitting these, uh, the, the conduction bands, we got a uh, interchannel coefficient uh, interchannel coefficient that is uh, almost 10 times smaller than the nanoporous graphene. Okay, so this is already telling us that the, if you move from having a single bond to having a benzene ring, that decreases the um, that decreases the con the conductivity itself. But when we go to the meta, essentially, you can see that the band structure is, is quite similar, but this time uh the two uh, the two lo low energy longitudinal bands are almost um one on top of each other so actually when here we extracted this interchannel coupling coefficient it's almost 100 times smaller than the nanoporous graphene and, and more than 10 times smaller than the uh par nanoporous graphene okay so this should have an effect on transport clearly so we calculated the transmission in small devices. So this, this, these two devices, which allow us to calculate transport along the graphene and direction and along the bridges. 
Uh, so this, just for you to remember, this is what happened with the fabricated nanoporous graphene. Um, so focus here on the yellow, which is along the graphene nanorigons, and on the purple uh, curves, which is along the bridges. So what we get for the para. So this is what we get now. So the dotted line is along the graphene nanoribbons. And you can see that it's, it really looks much more quantized than for the fabricated nanoporous graphene, eh, this yellow curve, which already is telling us, you know, that the graphene nanoribbons are behaving more like nano objects than in the fabricated uh, material. And the transmission along the bridges is also smaller than in the nanoporous graphene. Okay, now what about the meta uh, uh, MPG? So here we get this picture. So we can, you can see that the quantiza quantization is even along the graphene nanoribbon direction is even more clear. So the transmission along the graphene nanoribbon channels have clear steps. But now if we focus on the transmission along the bridges, which is the uh, kind of continuous line, so we can see now that uh, really the, the meta configuration has significantly decreased the transmission uh, for, for a certain range of energies around 0 0.7 electron volts. So really around that energy, it looks like uh, the, the, the transmission along the bridges, so between the graphene nanoribbons, is completely suppressed. And this does not happen for the para nanoporous graphene. Okay, so these were like really promising results, but really the final uh, kind of test that we had to do was really to go into the larger scale and see what happened with the, uh, with the bond currents in the same way that was done before for the fabricated nanoporous graphene. So, um, so yeah, uh, so now essentially it will show the results, the, this, uh, the, the results that they did before for the fabricated one, but uh, in, this, in this kind of position. So it's standard, just, just for you to don't get confused. And for that we just, again, we had to use the FT parameterized type binding models because of course to these larger scales it's impossible to go with uh, DFT and combined with Green's functions, which allow you to do uh, transport. So these are the two unit cells that we used uh, in DFT to kind of get the uh, preliminary idea of the electronic structure of these networks. And then we essentially repeated the unit cell, I don't know how many times, like maybe 10 or 20 and then maybe 100, something like that. And essentially you get these huge devices which um, more than 250,000 atoms. So you can see really that the orientation of the graphene nanoribbons is in that direction. And you can see the two different types of uh, bridges. So in para and here in, uh, in meta. Okay, um, so these devices are like uh, more than 100 nanometers long, almost 100 nanometers wide. And um, so we injected on the central graphene nanoribbon for each device at that energy, at the energy that we said that, you know, you could uh, suppress completely the, trans the, the, the coupling between the graphene nanoribbons in the meta, okay? So at 0 0.7 electron volts at that, that point. Okay, so what happens with the para MPG? So this is what we get. So you can see that this is again the Talbot uh, interference pattern, that very similar to what we were getting for the uh, nanoporous fabricated that they got for the nanoporous, fabricated uh, nanoporous graphene. But you can see that now the Talbot uh, kind of um, the localization pattern is it's smaller. Eh? And that, that makes sense because, you know, electrons, it's more difficult for the electrons to go through uh, um, across the, the, the benzene ring as compared to a single bond. Now, what happens with the meta uh, nanoporous graphene where there is quantum interference? So essentially you get a full confinement of currents on a single graphene nanoribbon with a width of 0 0.7 nanometers. So it's really kind of sub-nano uh, confinement of, uh, sub-nanometer uh, confinement of currents. This also works for the valence band, not just for the conduction band. There is a particular energy at the valence band where this also happens. But when you go to much larger energies, then this quantum interference starts to uh, kind of break, let's say. And so also in the meta, you start to get uh, kind of uh, spreading uh, between neighboring, uh, two neighboring graphene nanoribbons. 
Now, this is also nice because, um, it, I mean, there are some experiments where they have been able to actually inject currents onto the materials with one STM tip and then read those currents with a second STM tip. So you could imagine like, okay, so what would be the reading in this tool, all right? Uh, let's say in the bottom, I mean, in, in, in this part, in the, let's say, top part of our, um, of our device. So here in the para, this is the signal that we got. And you can see that it's, because it's quite a spread, it's, it's quite a, uh, low, the signal. But in the meta, because it's completely confined on a single graphene nanorubin, essentially you get a very high signal compared to the uh, para MPG. So this is not just nice because you essentially get the currents on a single, I mean, with sub nanoscale precision, you can direct the, current, the electrons with sub, sub nano scale precision, but also because that in turn makes that the currents are very, I mean, the intensity that you get is larger because all the electrons that you're injecting are, are there. They don't go somewhere else. So essentially the, the message of this is that the meta nanoprotrophine could be really used as a platform for carbon nanocircuitry because you get this uh, sub nanoscale confinement. Now, of course, there is the question of is this feasible really in the future? These things could be made. And uh, well, there are preliminary studies where they have been able to connect, you know, these bottom up fabricated graphene nano ribbons with this type of connections. So, for instance, here you have a close STM or AFM image, and you can see that actually there are types of para bridges, uh, bifenyl para bridges, and also meta. So it really looks like, you know, the things that we are doing, despite the fact it's kind of a further step because these are just two graphene nanorubins, we will need many more, but it, it looks like it might be feasible in the future, all these, all these things. Okay, and the, la the last thing that I want to show is that, okay, so uh, very quickly, so yeah, this parameter thing really looks like an electronic playground, something that you could play around and do more kind of crazy things. Uh, because the nanoprotrophin is made up, the nanoprotrophin uh, that was reported by uh, Mugartha and, and co-workers is made of graphene nanoribbons. You can think that any advances that are done with graphene nanoribbons could be, you know, thought of like, okay, maybe that could be translated to uh, uh, the nanoporous graphene technology. And really, with graphene nanoribbons, as you know, and we have been seeing these days, it's just crazy. I mean, uh, you know, here you have these results from Facel. So uh, making very complex, atomically precise uh, uh, nanostructures on these graphene nanoribbons, which then lead to topological states and all sorts of uh, things. And here you have an, another example, uh, another example from another group, which is more relevant for what I want to say now. So, for instance, you can actually build uh, or, or fabricate different types of graphene nano ribbons, and by using specifically designed um, uh, kind of um, intermediate uh, um, building blocks, you can actually bind those different types of graphene nano ribbons and make these kind of heterostructures, atomically precise hetero heterostructures. So we thought, okay, what, what about if we say that maybe in the future you could make one of these graphene nanoribbons where one of the one kind of led to this meta connection and the other one to para connection? Because the para and meta MPGs are actually have the same unit cell. We, we, we thought, okay, so let's try to see what would, what would happen if we actually had a hybrid device where we had a meta module with the meta connections, a para MPG module, and another meta module. What would happen here? And in the same way that I, they actually had to use this kind of um, interface building block, kind of binding the two, we also had to use interface uh, building blocks to connect these three different uh, modules. We built the thing, it's quite large, uh, more than 150, uh, 50, no, sorry, more than 350, thousand atoms, slightly less than that, uh, more than 150 nanometers long, and this is a hybrid meta, para, meta, and PG. So another question is, okay, we inject uh, down, down here, so the question is, what will happen with the currents? And what happens is this, okay, so essentially what makes sense uh, based on the previous results. So essentially we are confining on the first module, 
we are spreading on the second module because uh, quantum interference in the middle one is removed. And when the currents hit the third module, they get localized again because the graphene and ribbons are decoupled. And so though the, the, the pattern that you generate on the middle module gets frozen up to the top electrodes. This thing, of course, is highly tunable. If you make the middle uh, para MPG module smaller, you get a different pattern. So for instance, this kind of thing that could be understood as a beam nano splitter. And also because the, the Talbot interference angle depends on the energy, if you kind of change the injection energy with respect to the Fermi level, you can confine these currents more uh, or, or less. And this could be done externally uh, with, with an external gate. Okay, so that's, that's kind of it. Uh, I just, well, I will not go to the, to the summary. I mean, it's just uh, what, what, what I explained. Let's see if I have time for one question. And, um, and yeah, that's it. I just want to thank, uh, thank you all for your attention and to the team that was behind the scenes. That was great. So thank you very much, uh, Isaac. Yeah. Um, I think uh, I've not seen any questions. Uh, all right. So if nobody have a, no problem. a fast question, I, I also suggest that maybe people can stay a bit after the session if there's somebody who wants to hang around, uh, ask questions. Uh, okay, absolutely. Know, maybe. Um, okay. okay, so thank you again. Thanks. And we move on to the next speaker. This is um, uh, David Indolese. And uh, David is going to tell us about a compact squid realized in a double layer graphene heterostructure. So please, David. Um, I don't know if you are unmuted. Let me see. No, yeah, no, it's fine. Good. I guess. Thank you very much. <laughs> so thank you very much again uh, for the opportunity to present here recent results uh, of our research and uh, where we used the ability to van der Waals stack different 2D materials to fabricate uh, a compact squid. I mean, the squid is a superconducting quantum interference device, uh, which is extremely sensitive to uh, magnetic fields. And usually it consists, as you see here on the bottom left, out of a superconducting uh, ring or loop, which is intersected by two uh, so-called Jossman junctions, weak links, which are decoupling these two superconductors. Now, uh, for our research, we had to investigate a new structure uh, where the two Jossman junctions are not placed like far apart in a planar uh, geometry, but stacked on top of each other um, by using, in our case, graphene as the weak link between the left and the right superconductor and isolate them with a thin bone nitride layer. The goal of this uh, project is then in the end to study the coupling between uh, um, quantum ball edge states of the top and the bottom layer graphene, which can be counter-propagating depending on uh, the charge carry densities in the two layers. And by coupling these, uh, we want to be able to induce and detect topological superconductivity. And our squid measurement is maybe then one tool to detect uh, this uh, state. So, just to for a short introduction, I mean, superconductors are well known now for over 100 years. Uh, these are materials which have a vanishing resistance below a certain critical temperature and also show the Meissner effect, so they expel uh, external magnetic fields in, in the bulk when they are cooled below TC. It was shown by Bardeen, uh, uh, Cooper and Schieffer that these that electrons in this material condense into so-called Cooper pairs. And this is mainly due to uh, electron formal interactions. And Ginsburg, Borg, and Landa found phenomeno phenomenologically a wave function to describe the state, which is given by the density of the Cooper pairs times a phase factor, uh, which is the macroscopic phase describing this state. 
and this phase will be now in the following an important quantity to describe the interference effect of the squid. So before we go to the squid geometry directly, I just want to say some words on the Josselin effect because this is a uh, main building block of the device. So the, uh, the Josselin found that if you couple two superconductors weakly, uh, for example by insulator, then you still can have a supercurrent, so a, a current without resistance flowing across this junction uh, if, if this uh, middle section is thin or short enough. And he found that the supercurrent directly depends on the phase difference of the superconducting state from the left and the right superconductor. And this gives you the, the current phase relation uh, between your supercurrent and your phase difference. And for insulator, it was found that this is just a sinusoidal uh, dependence. The largest critical, or the, this IC, which you see here in front, is just the largest supercurrent which can flow then across the such a junction. And it has been shown that, for example, for graphene, using here as a uh, weak link between the superconductors, it's even gate tunable, depending on the charge carry density. Uh, which are induced in the graphene layer. In a more general way, uh, when we want, want to study magnetic fields, one has to define the space difference gauge invariant, such that you, it also depends on the vector potential, um, yeah, which describes your magnetic field. So before we go to the squid, one or certain words about the current phase relation and how it's determined. So before we saw that the current phase relation for an uh, insulator is just a sinusoidal uh, function, but this current phase relation can be uh, non-sinusoidal, for example, for metal and junctions. And it was shown that this depends strongly on the number of channels which you have and the transparency of these channels. And then you get this more uh, general form of, your, of the relation between the current and your phase difference, which now denoted as phi. And you can see that for higher and higher transparent channels, this sinusoidal, which is shown in red, starts to skew or to yeah, get a tilt, which we call skewness, and the maximum position shifts away from pi hall. And this is also then the, the, me uh, the measure which we take to determine if you have high transmissive uh, channels in the system or not, is the skewness, which is defined as the relative deviation from the maxima of the measured current phase relation from pi hall. So first, I want to uh, introduce the basic principle by talking about the planar squid, as you can see it here on top schematically or here on the bottom uh, in the real device, which was fabricated by Nanda et al, where they used two graphene Josselin junction intersecting the superconducting loop, and with two gates, they can tune the, the critical current of both junctions individually. So in the squid, the total uh, critical current or total supercurrent is given by the sum of the current in the two Josselin junctions, and their phase differences, differences are related by the flux, which is penetrating through the superconducting loop by this relation here. So when one then calculates or replaces like phi one with phi, uh, phi two with phi one, for example, and assume a symmetric uh, uh, squid so that such that the two critical currents are the same and just assign a sinusoidal current phase relation, we obtain uh, this expression where the total supercurrent is just uh, proportional to a cosine, absolute value of a cosine. And this was measured at 4 Kelvin for these graphene junctions where you have uh, low transparencies and you observe this uh, cosine dependence. So let's start with our device. And uh, as I said in the beginning, we used the ability to van der Waals stack different materials on top of each other. So you can exfoliate them from uh, different materials, for bueno, example. So you can exploit them from different materials, for example, of, out of graphite. Uh, as you see here on top right, you 
uh, thin down the materials by a low adhesion tape and then transfer them on silicon uh, silicon wafer. And then by picking up one layer after each other, you can fabricate your complex uh, devices. Uh, just here, I ch show it once schematically on the top and on the bottom, you see some microscope uh, pictures. So we use or we employ a PC layer, which is with a high adhesion on a PDMS pillow carrying this PC. And then by going in contact with the individual flakes, we can uh, move the piece interface, which is seen here with the pink line, over the flake and retract it, and then pick up one layer after the other. In fact, is it's possible then to fabricate these multi-layer devices, which I will describe now in the following. So this is the device which we fabricated in the end. Uh, this is a look from the top. Here on the right, you see a, a side view where we cut with a fib the structure in, in two pieces. So it consists out of superconducting electrodes, which are shown here in blue. Then a, a gold global top gate, which is insulated by a thin aluminum oxide layer. And here in brown, you see the etched or the, the mesa, which we uh, etched out of the stack in the region where we had all the layers on top of each other. Maybe it's easy to see in the side view. So we have a global graphite backgate, a bottom bore nitride to insulate also the electrodes from the gate. For this, we have to carefully etch down into the bore nitride, but still have some uh, remained uh, substrate there. Then we have a first graphene layer and a bore nitride layer in between to insulate it from the other graphene layer a top graphene layer to protect the, the layer from contamination and then yeah the aluminum oxide and the gate. Uh, a comment on the side, um, the edge contacts which we use were out of um, multimerinium and this uh, was used because in the end what we want to study is uh, the interplay between the quantum hall effect and superconductivity in the structure and for this we need a superconductor which can sustain in high magnetic fields and the uh, critical magnetic field of multimedium is here, or it's in our case, between eight and 10 Tesla. So in the first place, <clears throat> what we uh, will show here is that we are able by the global top metal gate and the global graphite bottom gate to tune the charge current density in the bottom and the top uh, graphene layer independently. And by tuning, the charge current density, as shown before, you also can adjust the critical currents, and this is what you see in this map. So at high uh, charge current density, we get a critical current of uh, such a junction of around three microamp, and it's lower at the uh, at the region where both junctions are then uh, hold doped. This is just due to a work function mismatch between the graphene and the molten rhenium leads which induces a PN junction and lowers the transmission of the channels, which we will see later as well in the current phase relation. And here we just showed two cuts at uh, densities of zero of each layer. And then you see the typical dependence as for the conductivity, which depends on the number of channels and electron density. So by this ability of tuning the critical currents ind independently, we first studied the, this squid device uh, by applying an in-plane field uh, in a symmetric uh, configuration where the two critical currents are more or less the same. And in our stack we had, or by this fundamental stacking, we could choose uh, bore nitride flakes which had different thicknesses, so different cross sections in the end, which gives you a different flux dependence. And this is what we measured in the end. So this is the critical current as a function of the in-plane magnetic field. And you see the different uh, periodicities and the uh, absolute cosine-like behavior as a function of the flux or the different uh, cross sections which are depicted here. So we can adjust the sensitivity to the in-plane magnetic field basically by choosing just the different HPN uh, spacer between the two graphene layers. Strikingly, we observed that the interference pattern doesn't go fully to zero. 
which can have two reasons. One is that the two currents are not fully symmetric. The other is that we may have a non-sinusoidal current phase relation. And just to uh, uh, get this into an image, uh, I will show you on this slide, I mean, how we basically get to this interference pattern, which leads to this absolute cosine. So you have your supercurrent, which is sum of the two currents flowing in two junctions. And this expression, one has to maximize over the over phi one for every value of magnetic flux. So if you have two sinusoidal current phase relation with the same amplitude, uh, you can have some uh, phase shift given by, by the flux as shown here. But uh, you can also just have a phase shift of uh, half a flux quanta or by inducing half a flux quanta. And then the if you sum these two uh, currents up, you get everywhere zero. And then if you take the maximum of this, you get a supercurrent of zero, which is then corresponds to the interference pattern as shown before. Now you can imagine that, okay, if the two critical currents are not the same, you can still shift them by, uh, by a phase of pi, which still leads to... Uh, Okay, um, which still leads, I mean, to a cancellation partially of the of the total supercurrent, but still you will have everywhere a finite value, and uh, your supercurrent will not go to zero at the half flux quantum. In the last case, which I show you here on the bottom, uh, we have uh, a skewed sinusoidal current phase relation, but same uh, amplitude. And here, if you shift these two curves uh, with respect to each other, maybe you find a, a phase difference such that one peak is on top of the other, but uh, then you will have any, uh, somewhere else always a finite magnitude of your uh, supercurrent here, such that you will have a non-vanishing point at, pi half, at uh, half a flux quanta. And this is what we then did in the follow-up measurement. So by adjusting now one critical curve much larger than the other, it's actually possible to measure the current phase relation uh, of, of the junction with the smaller critical current. Um, I will not go here now in detail, but this is what you did shown here. So we kept one uh, layer at the high density and swept the or changed the carry density in the other one around the Dirac point where the uh, supercurrent is much smaller than for the reference junction. And we observe that there is an oscillating pattern um, on top of a background, as you could see here. So we have the reference junction, which is, has a large critical current, which gives you a constant offset. And then you have uh, oscillation, which is given by your current phase relation as a function of your magnetic flux. What we observe then is here showing some line cuts of the previous map, which I showed you. So we see that by subtracting the, just the supercurrent of the reference junction, that we see an, a skewed uh, sinusoidal current phase relation. And by extracting this, the skewness, we indeed see that this value deviates from zero, which would be just a sinusoidal one, by roughly uh, 0 0.15 for the whole doped uh, graphene. And it decreases up to 0 0.25 on the electron side, indicating Large, indicating large uh, transmissive uh, channels in our graphene system, which we um, investigated here. So just a summary on this slide before I come to the outlook, what we want to do now in the next step. So we were able to engineer this double layer graphene squid, which is sensitive to in-plane magnetic fields. Uh, by this van der Waals, header, uh, van der Waals uh, in engineering to measure the current phase relation and also the interference pattern of a symmetric squid and show that there are highly transparent channels in both layers present at the same time. But this gives hope that we can go towards the coupling of these states on the top and the bottom. And also, like the final goal will be to go into quantum Hall regime. If you have a clean device, then uh, the degeneracy in spin and belly lifts such that one would have a, 
uh, edge state of or counter can induce counter propagating edge states with opposite spin polarization in the two layers and couple them by a superconductor. And this is now the next steps. We want to see if you can use cross and rear reflection at zero magnetic field and also study then like the superconducting quantum hollow scheme by using Finderborn nitride spacer to increase the coupling strength between the two layers. And maybe also the alignment of the two layers is a crucial uh, point since the momentum uh, space has to match. If, um, yeah. So with this, I want to thank uh, my co-workers uh, who supported me during this work and contributed everyone on Zoom. So uh, I think my time is up. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, so this is a talk by Anthony Impilicelli, and the title of the talk is Impact of Mechanical Folding on the Electronic Properties of 2D Materials. So let me just see if... Yes. Anthony is there. Good. Okay. Thanks a lot, Mads, um, and I am very pleased to see you again. Um, so um, can you see my... Uh, my screen now. Cool, perfect. So let's talk. So uh, first of all, thanks all the, um, the organizers for this nice opportunity to participate at this conference um, in order to share my results, focusing uh, on the impact of mechanical folding um, on the electronic properties of 2D nanomaterials. Um, so my project uh, is born in terms of a joint collaboration between the Institute of Materials General Cell and the Laboratory of Physics and Nanostructures um, in Paris, on France. Um, and uh, at the beginning, I would like to provide um, a quick primer about the high level of uh, versatility and deformability of carbon-based nanostructures. Because um, in, uh, it is very, very known that uh, carbon is a unique uh, very element um, uh, which is possible uh, to um, uh, result in a plethora or collection of different nanostructures uh, characterized by different uh, dimensionality. Because, uh, for example, at zero dimension, we can mention uh, the most common um, uh, C60 Fuller uh, uh, molecule or the carbon nanoconions uh, composed by a concentric configuration of different uh, fullerenes with increasing diameters, uh, nanocons, and so on. And one dimension, we can have the ruled up uh, graphene sheet uh, known as the single word carbon in the tube, or graphene nanoribbons, or the helicoidal version of nanotubes. Um, at two dimension, of course, we can mention, we need to mention uh, the clean and defective version of graphene or uh, 2D network of nanoribbons. Whereas at 3D level, we can have the 3D network of nanotubes. Um, and with this list of different structures, it is possible to state that um, uh, it is possible to uh, manipulate the, 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 carbon, the carbon structure in order to obtain a different um, uh, nano configuration depending on the specific applications in terms of the nanoelectronics, optoelectronics, and uh, spintronics, and so on. However, in the last years, um, uh, there were a few experimentalists that uh, have had an intense interest in order to work on, uh, in order to deform the geometry of multi world carbon nanotubes in order to create other um, uh, structures um, uh, for nanoelectronic applications. Um, different methods are developed for this goal. Um, for example, in terms of chemical methods, we can uh, consider the introduction of oxidizing agents in order to break carbon-carbon bonds, the intercalation or exfoliation in the solution based on a combination of lithium and ammonia, the introduction of catalytic metal nanoparticle in order to open the nanotube along the longitudinal directions or the application of the electric current throughout the nanotube and zipping the nanotube always um, along the periodic axis. And by using uh, all this process, um, it is possible to get uh, in the end um, a ultra high quality of graphene nanoribbons, uh, which, smooth, which are characterized by smooth edges and controllable width. Um, but in the other end, um, uh, the meaning uh, always in, into the context of multi-world carbon nanotubes, um, uh, if we remove the, the caps and the ends, um, it is possible by using a ultrasonic sonicator 
to extract um, the inner nanotubes um, and just considering the largest, the largest diameter of nanotube um, where a specific condition in terms of pressure and temperature, it is possible to observe um, uh, and spontaneously the deformation in terms of flattening uh, geometry of the carbon nanotubes, um, which is possible to visualize in terms of the transmission electron microscopy images shown below. Um, However, given the complex architecture of this novel class of flattening deformation, it might be useful to consider the following schematic representation, where we have two edge bulbs whose geometry resemble the canonical configuration of cylindrical single world carbon nanotubes, which are connected by using a central flattened region, which is very, very similar to simple bilayer graphene. So for this hybrid system between circular carbon nanotubes and bilayer graphene, the energy balance is given in terms of competitive process between the van der Waals forces exerted in the middle against the, the, the repulsive strength energy due to the deformation for the, for the edge cavities. In general, it's known that uh, uh, circular carbon nanotubes are characterized in terms of the rotational rolling uh, in the uh, like degree of freedom. Because if we start to consider a simple monolayer graphene and uh, considering the application in terms of the, the chiral and angle vector, it is possible to perform the operation as we can see in terms of the following um, uh, animation, obtaining a carbon nanotube. But in this new case, in terms of the, considering the existence of a central flattened region, it is possible to define uh, uh, an additional second degree of freedom, uh, uh, which, is, which is due in terms of the translational shearing between upper and lower layer, as we can possible to see in terms of the following animation. And in such sense, it is possible to define a stacking sequence for the uh, collapsed carbon nanotubes, um, exactly like a bilayer graphene or bilayer graphene nanoribbon. And in such sense, um, we can uh, represent our collapsed carbon nanotubes um, as a sort of analog of bilayer graphene nanoribbon with closed edges. Um, the meaning in terms of the uh, experimental context, um, uh, in, the following, uh, in the following setup, um, if we consider the deposition of catalytic gold nanoparticle into the silicon nitride grid, um, after the air calcination in order, in order to reduce uh, the particle size uh, and by using the chemical vapor deposition, it's possible to grow single world carbon tubes, where after the end of this procedure, it is possible to get the resulting samples in terms of the collapsed carbon nanotubes, which is possible to visualize in terms of the transmission electron microscopy with um, a hexagonal graphene symmetry into the central flattened region. It is possible to identify with corresponding electron diffraction. Also, the experimentalists um, have reported um, a correlation between um, the, the, the chiarity of the nanotube in terms of the corresponding stacking sequences and corresponding nanotube diameter. Observing that, um, all resulting samples um, are automatically collapsed um, after overcoming a given uh, threshold of the diameter, um, which is um, nearly equal to 5.1 nanometer. And it looks like that um, uh, this sort of collapse threshold diameter seems to be slightly dependent by the specific lattice combi uh, stacking combination between phasing layers. So from this initial experimental observation, we have started a French principle um, investigation um, uh, based on density functional uh, calculation um, coupled with Van der Waals correction by using the Ebenezer software package AIMPRO. The starting point of our analysis was based on to the, anal the analysis of the interlayer potential um, of the binding energy for the simple uh, infinite flat bilayer graphene um, with different stacking combinations, um, where um, the most stable configuration Configuration is the AB Bernard stacking, of course. And by continuing in terms of the energy stability scale, we, we can have other stacking configurations till to reach the less stable one AA. After that, we have calculated the total energy difference between cylindrical and collapsed configuration in order, as a function of the diameter in order to establish, in order to confirm the previous experimental observation in terms of the thermodynamical preferential for the collapsing deformation.
and it is possible to read and see this plot as a sort of phase diagram because um, for uh, nanotube with diameters uh, lower than 1.9 nanometer, all uh, nanotubes um, are automatically circular because the diameter is too much smaller. So it is not possible to get a, 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 an energy balance between a central flat region and uh, uh, formation of the edge cavities. Um, for uh, diameters uh, between 1.9 to 5.1 nanometer, um, we start to get um, uh, collapsed uh, uh, configurations, uh, but uh, corresponding total energies are systematically higher in comparison to the cylindrical ones. So in such sense, uh, we got uh, the metastable uh, collapsed states. And just after 5.1 nanometer, our nano two, our collapsed states um, uh, prefer to lower states in terms of the um, collapsed configuration because are more stable in terms of in corresponding uh, respect to the, the cylindrical ones. Um, but the 5.1 nanometer in terms of collapsed fissure diameter was obtained just for the AB stacking. Um, yeah, if, so if we try to consider all other stacking combination along the central flattened region, um, it is possible to see how this um, collapsed fissure diameter seems to shift towards um, uh, higher, uh, higher values um, in uh, agreement with, initial, uh, with previous experimental observation. In terms of geometry parameters, it is possible to see how the interlayer distance, the central flat region, um, is very is quite similar to that found for the turbostatic graphite, whereas the diameter of the edge cavity is slightly higher in comparison um, to that observed for the diameter of uh, C60 fullerene. Um, but of course, an important question in this context, um, uh, it would be, um, what is the benefit to consider and produce um, uh, this novel class of um, carbon nanotubes? Um, so that's why we started to study the corresponding electronic properties. Um, in fact, if we consider just an infinite flat by layer graphing, independent of the stacking combination, in general, the graphing is considered as, is defined as sort of zero gap semiconductor um, towards the Dirac point. Um, since in order to open um, a band gap for the bilayer graphing, we need to consider additional factor to, for example, the application of the LA external electric field in order to establish a different potential between layers and opening of a band gap. Um, in terms of the armchair nanotube, um, the armchair circular nanotube are found to be metallic. But after the, the self-collapsing deformation, independent of the stacking combination, we can see how for all cases examined and illustrated here, we have the common characteristics of the opening of a band gap. At that point, it's very, very important because we are clearly showing that the Geometry phase transition from a circular to collapsed um, uh, configuration induces um, a second electronic phase transition, um, converting an uh, initial metallic system into semi semiconducting system. At this point, I found uh, um, an explanation in terms um, of the study of the uh, charge distribution um, um, on, on, along the geometry nanotube by changing the, the corresponding sides. And it is possible to observe, um, by overcoming a given threshold of the width, um, a charge difference distribution between central flat region and edge cavity, demonstrating in such a way a sort of intrinsically pol uh, polarization of of the, uh, for, for the nanotube um, in an equivalent way of bilayer graphene after the application of the external electric field. Um, from an experimental point of view, uh, a few experimentalists have measured the conductance as a function of temperature, um, obtaining a for a chiral um, uh, carbon collapsed carbon nanotube um, characterized by a total width of 20 nanometer, an energy gap um, uh, of 13.7 milli electron volt. Um, so we have um, calculated um, for this reason um, the, the band gaps um, of both armchair and zigzag collapsed carbon nanotubes um, considering all possible factors in terms of the stacking combination between facing layers and subfamilies, um, obtaining that um, the estimated experimental value uh, lies in between in the, in the range established by our calcula calculations in terms of not chiral nanotubes and demonstrating in such a way the reality of our calculations. Um, the next point of our discussion is focusing in terms of the 
impact um, or the effects uh, of the, this type of uh, flattening deformation for the other um, two-dimensional nanomaterials, uh, the hexagonal boron nitride, um, because um, we have the direct um, and clear evidences about uh, the existence of folding ages uh, in terms of uh, different multilayers uh, recollapsed carbon nanotubes. Um, and for this reason, um, we have uh, simulated and modeled um, this type of configuration in terms of the monolayer uh, HBN characterized by different uh, uh, age cavities or collapsed boron nitride nanotube. Um, the interesting point uh, of this uh, structure uh, is possible to find in terms of the corresponding electronic properties. Um, in fact, in, into this slide, um, we have compared um, the electronic band structure um, of the collapsed boron nitride nanotube indicated here by solid black line with the electronic band structure of infinite flat uh, hexagonal bone and by layer without edge cavities here represented in terms of the filled color spaces. And by superposing the electronic band structures of these two system with and without edges, it is possible to observe for the collapsed uh, nanotubes the apparition of additional states in both regime valence and conduction depending on chirality. And these additional states um, uh, seems to uh, solely associated with the existence of edge cavities, as it is possible to observe in terms of the real space representation or the wave function distribution. At that point, it is very interesting because considering this flattening deformation, we find found an additional way in order to reduce the large band gap of our external bone nitride usually attributed to be nearly equal to 6 Eb. In order to invest, better investigate this point, we have calculated the corresponding projected density of states for, uh, from edge cavities till to reach the um, corresponding certain flattened region, observing the gradual apparition of these age states with consequent reduction of the energy gap. And in such sense, it is possible to represent our systems as a sort of two-type junction in terms of the band corresponding band alignment. And our theoretical result found an experimental matching in terms of the optical properties, because from an experimental point of view for folded samples, it is possible to observe in corresponding cathode luminescence spectrum the apparition of other additional peaks evidently due to the existence of the edge cavities. So, in conclusion, um, we have provided um, uh, an, exper an experimental um, demonstration uh, and uh, with theoretical prediction about the existence of uh, self-collapsed carbon nanotubes um, characterized by a st st stacking sequences with different chirality. The, the geometry conversion from um, circular to collapsed um, atomic configuration induces a conversion in terms of the change of the electronic behavior for the nanotubes. And in terms of the external bone nitride, we have clearly seen how the, the, the existence of the edge cavities um, strongly uh, uh, changed the, the electronic with corresponding optical properties of material of interest. And in terms of the future perspective, at the moment, um, there are our collaborators who have fabricated um, uh, the device composed with um, collapsed carbon nanotubes, uh, where it is possible, given the, the unique architecture of the cavity, to fill uh, the cavities by using uh, the uh, same or different uh, elements uh, in order to create, in such a way, a novel generation of um, graphene field effect transistors. Um, in the end, I would like to say thank you, my supervisors, um, Chris Jules um, and Dimitri Dibowski, and all my collaborators coming from different institutes, um, the CNRS, uh, the National Agency of Research for the Funding Plan, the um, uh, organizers of this very nice conference, uh, and of course, uh, all people um, for very, very um, kind attention. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Anthony, for a very nice presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm checking if there are some questions from the audience. Um, I don't see questions. Um, I have one question. Maybe in, in the end, you showed that you could you could fill up uh, the edges 
Yes, sir. What what kind of uh, filling would you put in to make it N and P type? Well, um, at the moment, uh, we have tried with different allerg allergens uh, in terms of the iodine uh, and bromine. Um, uh, honestly, the re the there is a possibility to consider, uh, as I shown into the last slide, the symmetry and asymmetry filling, because of course, in such sense, with different doping regime, it is possible to establish uh, the, the effect of uh, PN junction in such a way, considering the molecular filling. That's why a uh, possibility for our proposition is to consider two different molecules like the TTF um, and the TCNQ molecule in order to establish the electron donor and donor sector. Uh, in, in such sense, it is possible to consider um, the possibility to consider the effect of the in-plane electric field due to the difference uh, doping the GMA change transfer process due to the molecules. Um, yes, but how will you control if it's on one side P and on the other side N? Don't you think <laughs> you just, uh... Uh, that, that, that's the that's the key challenge uh, of, the, of the experimental setup. Um, okay. So uh, yeah. <laughs> The experimental problem. Okay, there's a question from Christian Wagner. To yeah, uh, please, uh, Christian. Well, um, in, well, in terms um, of uh, the, the chirality, um, of course, yes, the, our nanotubes are supposed to be chiral. Um, so, in general, it's the it's very complicated to control the clarity of the samples. But in, gen but in general, um, of course, there, there, there is um, a possible impact, impact of the clarity, but in terms of the application, um, this is not a main um, uh, impact the, the resulting properties of the device. Because independent of the stacking registry effect, it is possible to, to obtain, in the end, the geometry of interest for our non-electronic applications. Um, okay. There are no further questions. Um, I don't see any questions. Then I'll officially close the session and, and thank you all for participating. Um, I don't know if, if it's possible that, that people hang around if there are some, somebody who has questions to ask. Um, I, I don't know if, if it's uh, closing down the whole session. That that depends, I guess, on the we, the host, Jose Maria. Um, we can keep uh, also, we can we can keep the room open for half an hour if you want. Also, we can do the group photo. If ah, yes. everybody open the their cameras, right? And Jose Maria can take the the picture. All of us. Or maybe you, Jose Maria, can. Ah, no, you cannot open the, the, the video of, of the people. Uh, no, no, it's uh, every, everyone. Yeah. Okay. Almost, uh, almost everybody. I cannot open my camera. You have to allow me, please. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. No, it worked. Okay, there are three people in the first screen who has not opened the camera, Nestor, Kian Kun, and David. A few more seconds. Okay. Smile. Then the second screen. Jorge, you are in both screens. How, how are you doing this? <laughs> Super cameras. Yes. Uh... <laughs> oh, smile. Oh, 
just think. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Last one. Smile. Okay. So I will leave the, the room open for half an hour. So you can discuss. Uh, um, yeah. It's up to you. You know that you can also chat in private, one to one.